Absolutely, teaching the teachers. Well, enjoy the day, gentlemen. I'll, I'll leave you to enjoy your drink, and we'll s thank you very much. Okay. We're going to come on here, guys. Hello, welcome to the, the World Wide Web. Here we are online. Uh, great to have you here today. Can you tell us who you are and what brings you here? I'll start with you, Deanna. Yeah, this is Cindy's family. So we're all here to support her and MD, and we're so happy for her, and everything's amazing, and we can't wait to see what it's going to be. One legacy. She is an amazing lady, your mum. She just does everything in the background in the organisation so that Grandma Sadaha can just enjoy the, the conversations and, and take all the credit for it, really, isn't it? Isn't that how it works? Uh, we're not going to say anything about that, Mark. We're going to keep that one to ourselves, I think. I'll keep getting in trouble for that. So we wanna, can we edit the stuff or is it... Uh, so welcome along, guys. Thank you. Can you tell me who you are? And... I'm also C Cindy's sister. Cindy's sister? Yeah. Oh, welcome. Thank you. G'day brother-in-law, Cindy's brother-in-law, and uh, it's a great opportunity tonight. We're looking forward to it. Awesome. Uh, her brother, Tony, Cindy's brother. Yeah, we're really excited for her. And Cindy's sister as well. Sister, okay. Yep. Welcome, guys. Thanks very much for coming. We'll leave you to it. We'll walk around and... Let's see who we've got over here. Welcome, guys. My name's Mark. I'm here just doing a bit of a walk around to find out who everyone is and what brings you here. So can you tell me who are you and what brings you here? Uh, we're from Elite Taekwondo. Um, we've been around in Sydney for about 20, 25 years. Um, not me that long, but the club has been around. Um, and we're really excited to see the launch today. Absolutely. Yeah, same. We're, I'm from Elite Taekwondo. Yep. Uh, Who teaches the school? Um, Car his name's Carlo Gianpetro. Yeah. Welcome, guys. What are you looking forward to about today? Uh, just being involved in all of this and being around um, our community that, that we love and being all together again. What do you love about Taekwondo? Everything. Been doing it for over 15 years and it's just part of our lives and yeah, we can't imagine life without it. Yeah, Sam, I love the, the routine, the discipline, knowing that I've got my Taekwondo in my back pocket. Yeah. What do you think the greatest benefit is that you've got from Taekwondo? Um, Aside from that self, sense of self-confidence, it's also the community here. Like we have all grown up together, we've done a lot of stuff together and it's always amazing to see people you haven't seen for 10 years. Absolutely is. Well, thanks very much for coming, guys. Enjoy the afternoon. Sir, what brings you here today? Sorry, sir. What brings you here today? What are you excited about? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I want to I come to look at the, you know, talking to martial arts. And Grandma invited me, so. Welcome, welcome, great to have you here. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, yes. Here's the, here's the man of the hour. I'm gonna uh, bring you in, Grandma Sadaha. Everyone should know who Grandma Sadaha is. He's been in Taekwondo for 55 years. Now we've got the world watching, sir. How are you feeling? Uh, really fantastic, Mark, thank you very much. Also, all you see all the wonderful people here. I think today we are establishing something very unique as something for the whole entire community, ITF community in the world. That's exactly really what we want to do. After 55 years from training in Taekwondo, I'm following John Shaw's legacy, following John Shaw's footstep, and that is my dream, and that's what's going to happen. Thank you very much, sir, for doing this for us. And what are you excited about today, sir? Being part of Grandmaster's opening of One Legacy, I've known him now for six years. The biggest thing I've known about him and I absolutely love about him is his integrity. His integrity comes first and foremost. Therefore, it makes me want to be part of this organisation. Very proud of him. Thank you very much. I'm going to go around behind you here so that I don't reach across in front. And can you tell me how long you've known Grandmaster Daha? 37 years. 37 years. It's a long time. How, how did you first meet? Ah, just from Taekwondo, starting with Taekwondo, yeah, just got a, a flyer in the uh, local shop and uh, thought I'd give it a go. Started there and we became friends and then uh, nine years straight, trained seven days a week, nine years straight. Went to three world championships with Grandmaster Daho and yeah, it's been a long time, so yeah, and the uh, respect and the morals and the principles, especially travelling around the world with all the Grandmasters and things and seeing the corruptness and the unfairness, the racism and now uh, to have a new start with integrity and uh, you know uh, no politics 
no racism and a new start is fantastic. It's overdue, so. Yeah, yeah excellent, thank yeah. you. And so how do you think Taekwondo has changed your life? Oh, listen, mentally and physically without it, uh, I've had a lot of injuries, a lot of accidents, and my body would, would freeze and seize if I didn't. So, uh, you know, just aspects of everything, everything in life, you know, so it's fantastic, you know, yep. Awesome, well, thank you very much for joining us today. Enjoy the afternoon. We'll see you soon. Okay, maybe over here. Gentlemen, you are now live across the world. Uh, so I, I better not ask Mr. McIntyre anything, put his foot in his mouth. No. If you should ask him, don't ask me. I, <laughs> I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> well, go, Trevor, it's awesome to see you again, mate. It's been a long time. Tell us some, what excites you about today? Well, gathering all of our friends is uh, probably key to any development, making sure that the group of people we're all with are, you know, all bonded in a certain way. I think we're all bonded to head in the same direction. You've been doing Taekwondo for a long time now. How's it changed your life? Well, yeah, a long time, all my life really. I've coming up to you know 35 years of training and you know just the friendship groups you have. Zoran's an example, one of my long-term students, and they're like we're like brothers, brothers and sisters. Yeah, it certainly is a global family, isn't it? Yeah. How long have you been in, involved? Oh, I'd say 10 or 15 years, something like that. Oh, I don't keep uh, track of it really well, but um, no, it's been good. I, I love the um, discipline and the camaraderie and the friendship that I've got with Sir and all the other guys that train with us. It's, uh, it's great. Love going there every week, getting together with them all. You came down this morning, didn't you? Yeah, we, we, uh, my wife and I drove uh, from Newcastle to be here and support Grandmaster Da. How long is the drive from Newcastle? About hour and 50. Oh, that's not too bad. I take it the last hour of that's just the, once you get to Sydney, right? Just getting around the roads in the local city? Yeah, Sydney traffic, yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, indeed it is. Yeah, the, I, I come from Auckland and of course our traffic's pretty nasty, but you come here and you just relax and realise just how good we've got it. Yeah, you wouldn't have had much traffic over the ocean, would you? You're like, you know, <laughs> right in the air. <laughs> yeah, indeed we were, yeah, we were, yes. Well, thank you very much for coming, guys. I hope you enjoy the afternoon. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Master. Enjoy your day. You too, mate. Okay, Mr. Master Harper, you've had a lot to do with this uh, this opening today. You've been involved in this pretty much right from the start, haven't you? Uh, so what, um, what excites you about what's going to happen over the next three hours, four hours? Um, just, I think, a pretty historic moment. Um, you yeah, know, me personally, I've never joined. I've never left an ITF. So I've never left. I've never joined another organisation. I've only ever really ever been with uh, Grandmaster Da um, from the original General Choi ITF and then uh, the, the group that we joined in 2003. Um, so really looking forward to new beginnings and an opportunity to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. You and I will have a bit of a conversation about it. So off the topic of the organisation itself, um, how do you feel about the, the vibe here today? Oh, it's, it's huge. I just see the old faces, um, people that you've known from, you know, late 80s. Um, you haven't seen them for a while, but it just feels like going back and, you know, no, no time's passed, right? We're all a little bit greyer, we're all a bit more wrinklier, um, but, um, you know, just great friends and great people. It's a family of the ITF that keeps us going in, in many ways, right? We love the training, we love the... Um, the, what it brings out, the passion it brings out in us and, and the values and things that, we're, that are instilled in us from Taekwondo. It's the people, ultimately, isn't it? It, it, it is. It's the relationships. Um, and that you can walk into a dojang anywhere and be uh, welcomed like a, a family member. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, enjoy the, uh, the afternoon and we'll, we'll have a bit of a conversation, I think, at, at some point after Grandmaster Daha's welcome. So I'll speak to you soon again. Thank you. Okay, where have we not been? Uh, coming down the back here? Gentlemen, come in, you know, don't be shy, come into the circle. We're, there's, there's only a, you know, a couple of hundred thousand people watching here, so don't be, don't be nervous. Uh, <laughs> but here we are broadcasting over the web for the launch of One Legacy. What excites you about today? Oh, the excitement, just the, the future and um, everybody getting a fair go and um, my, my Grandmaster Daha's um, dedication to the art and and been rewarded for all his hard work. 
So how long have you been involved around Grandmaster Daha and, and involved in what was your what was your involvement in the organisation? I was been involved for about 38 years. I met Master uh, Grandmaster Daha back back being a, a blue belt and just come up through the grades and yeah, I've been you know associated with him ever since. Absolutely, he's, he certainly maintains a loyalty to the people around him, right? Because he, he gives that loyal to, loyalty to others and it's very easy to remain loyal to him, isn't it? Very easy to be loyal and uh, when you see the, the hard work he puts in and you want to be a part of that as well. Yes. Yeah, and how about you, sir? How are you, how are you feeling about what's, what's happening in the room today? Uh, it's awesome to see it. He, he's put his whole life into this, so he's, he, yeah, just... Um, it, it is a different level. Um. <laughs> it is. It's an exciting new start, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, I, actually, I must have, if you don't mind, I'll just pop over and have a word here with Master Ashik because you've um, been one of uh, Grandmaster Daha's key students for, well, for close to 40 years in your case, is it? Yeah, I, I started with Grandmaster Daha in 1983. Um, so well over, just over 40 years now. Um, I'm just here to support him. Um, He's been my teacher since 1983, even though we've, we've, we've taken different paths at times, but uh, I'm just here to support him and wish him well in whatever avenue or path he takes. Uh, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good man. He, he is, yeah. Well, what do you admire most about him? Uh, he's brutal honesty at times. So that's, I, don't, I don't like people that, you know, beat around the bush. So you'd rather know the truth than be told crap. So that's, that's one of his good traits. Some people can see it as a bad trait at times, but, you know, it's, it's something I, I admire from that perspective. You always know where you stand, don't you? I really admire that about him as well. Yeah, yeah. So, and then all of his students have learned that from him as well. Uh, as you spoke to Johat Karmas and Joe Hazarati, old school guys, we've learned from him that, that sort of um, uh, characteristics. So just so I wish him well in whatever, whatever he chooses in, in his path for Taekwondo in the future. Cool, thank you, Master Ashik. Let me uh, step in behind you here and come over to the young gentleman that we've got over here. Welcome, guys. Uh, what, uh, what brings you here today, apart from, of course, the launch? Uh, How did you get here? I, I got here, my daughter has been training with uh, Master Daha for oh, about five or six years now. Um, and just a loyalty and, and friendship the two of us have created. And I help him out around the gym as much as possible. And in the same, he trains me as much as possible. So. What do you, uh, how do you feel about the community of Taekwondo that you brought your daughter into? Oh, fantastic. Um, my, my daughter's probably not the most sporty of people. Uh, she's come in and they've been accepted with open arms. Um, takes a, take, they take the time, make sure that she's comfortable, go through things. Unfortunately, she doesn't train as hard as she should, but she, uh, she's got the right people in the right place to help her out and, and that loyalty's there. How do you feel about these young guys at the front that have been training with them since they were five and they're still going now in their 20s? Do you think that's going to be your daughter? Uh, I hope so. I, I really do. She, she enjoys it. She, it doesn't matter whether she puts the effort in or doesn't. She still enjoys the sport and the people around it. And, and this community and Grandmaster Daha is, is definitely dragging it that way. And hopefully One Legacy drags it the right way as well. So. Yeah, now, now, Ken, we've known each other ourselves for about 20 years now, a little bit over 20 years. Uh, it's been a little while since I've seen you. Um, it's great to see you again. What, what's uh, happening in your life around this, this One Legacy launch and all the exciting things going on at the moment? Certainly, I've been working with Grandmaster Daha and Sydney in putting One Legacy together. The key is that the reason for that, and it's been ongoing for quite a, quite a period of, of time, is that... He's moving forward in his values, which are, are exactly the same as uh, General Choi, Hong Kong Hai. Uh, and as a consequence, he's extremely transparent. He's an immense amount of integ uh, integrity. And there's no one better. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, you, you always know where he stands. He, he stands up for the values of the general. That's absolutely right. Yeah, thank you. I think we've got to go and get started now, do we, gentlemen? So we'll mosey on down towards the front and uh, hand over to Grandmaster Daha for the big launch. Oh, you got your own mic there, Grandmaster Daha? All yours, sir? Thanks. Okay, this day I want to take that opportunity 
and thanks everybody who they attending the open ceremony for the One Legacy International Taekwondo Federation. The purpose of the One Legacy International Taekwondo Federation is to give the martial art community, especially the ITF, the organization where they can feel being protected and their right will be recognized and they will learn what is all about General Shoi Hong Hee. His legacy is one of the most important things for us. We're here today to practice his legacy, to show the people what is really who General Shoi Hong Hee is. If we're going to go a little bit back to General Shoi's history, General Shoi was an amazing man. Have a creator organization, I will call it the bridge to reach the world. We're all here today because we met because of General Shoi. It wasn't General Shoi's legacy in his teaching, we probably will never met. I mean, this man, we have owned at least just one thing in life to keep his legacy alive. So we can continue and educate that younger generation. If we look to the world, what happened lately in the world, the world become a crazy. But if we follow the martial art, if we follow the true of Taekwondo, and that younger generation will be educated, will understand what is the correct why about life. General Shui Hong Hee legacy is saved my life. Now I wonder how many people around the world, their life has been saved by his legacy, his teaching, his art, his philosophy. Okay. Of course, I'm going to have a speech later on. But again, I want to thank every single one of you. But I want to mention a few people been working behind the scene. I didn't do all that by myself. Dave Musa, put your hand up, please, sir. And all his group, Bill and Bowles. Without those people, that will be impossible to do what we're doing today. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I want to thank you, all of you, for what you have done for us so far. Give him a big hand, please. There was another person, I'm sure he will be hiding somewhere. Put your hand up, buddy, Abud. Okay. He have got a lot to do, a lot to do what we are on yeah, here today. And there are a lot of people behind the scene has been helping through that journey. The one particular person been working day and night. I still haven't killed her yet, and she haven't killed me yet. We're still alive. Cindy. And honestly, I don't want anything from Cindy, but without her, we won't be what we are on here with this organization. Day and night, she's working. I want to thank you very much for that. And I want to thank the people that come from Melbourne and Brisbane and one Kiwi here. Where is he? Mark Benizevich. Mark is a great person. He always worked very hard for the ITF. Okay. And yeah, basically also I have a lot of friends here who they hope through that journey, especially with the World Cup, Trevor McIntyre. Put your hand up, Mr. Trevor McIntyre. That's what we are because of all those people behind the scene. If I have forgot one, I've got one person, all right? It's just unfortunate the line is too long for me to remember everyone. The one particular thing make that journey very successful, especially that night. Okay, the love of my life show up today. <laughs> my granddaughter. My, my granddaughter, Emily. And anyway, it's also all those boys here have been working behind the scene and they've been helping. Okay? Well, let's get on the right with our program. And again, there's a lot more coming, a lot of interview. Also, we have a lot of things to show you today. Again, thank you very much to spend the time to come in here to be part of this special journey and historical day. Thank you, every single one of you. Thank you very much.
Hi, uh, I'm Mark Benicevic, uh, I'm a 7th degree black belt from, from New Zealand, uh, they let me in, even though I'm from the other side of the ditch, uh, and I'm here today with Master Paul Harper, who has been uh, with Grandmaster Daha since the 80s, Late a long 80s. time. Yeah. Late 80s, yes. I first met Grandmaster Daha as a blue stripe, actually. Uh, I came over here for my sister's 21st, I think it was. And I came over and trained, and it's like, you, know, you take a dough walk with you when you travel, right? And I jumped in, uh, and my instructor, uh, Grandmaster McPhail, said, oh, you know, go and train with Master Daha. And, uh, and so off I went. Uh, he didn't remember that when I moved over here in the, in the 2000s, because, you know, I was just a little chumpy kid, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, it, it's been a long time myself, too. Anyway, we're going to have a bit of a chat. Great. I'm going to interview you. Fantastic. Yeah, I look forward to hearing more about you, Master Harper. We're going to start with, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your background in Taekwondo? Yeah, absolutely. Started um, training in 1984. 1984 was my first That means class. you're old, right? Uh, we were just talking before and looking at uh, meeting some of the old faces. We're all greyer. We're, there's a few more wrinkles, but the conversation's still the same as what it was every time we see each other, which is fantastic. Um, so I started training in 84, and we were under um, Master Yun. So local club, uh, trained with a, a gentleman from the UK, and good technique. So a lot of the clubs in Australia had either uh, been re, and then were coming to the ITF, or there's, you know, there was always a challenge in terms of if you had re technique, and was it up to up to up to uh, the standard of the ITF? We luckily never had that challenge and had that problem, which was great. But um, started in 84, um, 1989, so we're with Master Yun, and I never met Grandmaster Daya at that stage. Um, so we used to go out and do the gradings and, and the like. Um, and then Master Yun left the ITF. In the late 80s, left the ITF, and I was just nearing ready to go for first degree. 
and we looked around and went, how are we going to do this? Because we didn't know. I mean, my instructor was a second degree and uh, I met Grandmaster Daya as a fourth degree. And he said, come to Ballarat and I want to have a look at you first. And I met a number of faces here today and they're sitting back there, uh, the two Joes and Master Al Sheikh. Uh, and remember him jumping around the hall, which was freezing cold in Ballarat in a sleeping bag, making everyone laugh, <laughs> which was... Good times. I don't, he probably doesn't remember that. <laughs> Selective memory. <laughs> um, and so we did a seminar and then I was invited to grade uh, three months after that. And uh, got through the grading, really physical grading. Um, had a, you know, it was just such a great memory. Uh, and I was told that I needed to put on weight and get a haircut at the end of the grading. <laughs> um, I put the weight on. Um, the hair still here while well, it went and then it's come back. Yeah. So uh, that was 1989. And so um, ever since then, I had a, a little bit of a break um, because my instructor ended up going back to the UK. Uh, and then I ended up coming back and I found a club which was about 20 minutes away from home. Went in, had a training session and they said, oh, we've got a grading uh, this weekend. Why don't you come along to the grading? Oh yeah, great. Turn up to the grading. Guess who's sitting at the uh, examiner's table? Grandmaster Daya. And so we've been together uh, since then, really, um, and uh, been on a numerous amount of trips, world championships, world cups, uh, travelling around Australia, did a, a road trip. Um, uh, sort of early 2000s, we met on the Gold Coast and then we drove all the way up to Cairns, doing gradings along the way. And some of the conversations in the car along the way, you know, you get to, you, you really yeah. learn and know about and, and understand someone. So um, that was, that was fantastic. And, you know, big, big impact on my life, uh, big impact on my family's life. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, just a privilege to have, you know, really been with Grandmaster Daya since those late, uh, the late 80s. I've got to ask as a co um, that drive, how long is it? Uh, so uh, we did it in about, uh, what was it, three days. But for anyone that understands, you know, some of the distances, we did a grading in Bowen on the, on, in the evening. We yeah. finished about 7.30, 8 o'clock and we jumped in the car from Bowen and drove all the way to Cairns because we wanted to have a rest day. And uh, we, I did an hour, I think I swapped with Grandmaster Day in Townsville and he drove the rest of the way to uh, Cairns. But that meant that we had the next day free to do uh, and relax by the pool. It's, it just it baffles me how huge this country is. Eh? It's, a, it's a big place. As I think I was talking to Sydney earlier, and uh, I think it was Sydney, and talking about how it's, it's closer to go to Auckland than it is to go to Perth from Sydney. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, back to the subject matter at hand. Uh, like many of us, you have uh, a life outside of Taekwondo. It, it, it's not a huge important part of your life. Of course, Taekwondo is the, more, the bulk of it. Uh, but you have to put bread on the plate. So what is, tell me about your professional career and yeah, your background. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm a qualified uh, CPA accountant, uh, but don't hold that against me. People say to me that I'm the most unlike accountant that they've ever met. Um, but I've worked in finance functions. I've worked for places like uh, all, you know, a number of the big companies in Australia, NAB, Bank. Uh, worked for uh, Telstra uh, and worked for uh, Deakin University. Um, and now I've sort of morphed over time out of finance function roles uh, in, the, in, you know, in the accounting type space and really moved into implementing uh, accounting and, and HR software. So I'm currently... Uh, uh, leading a project uh, at the University of Melbourne uh, to implement uh, payroll, HR, finance and procurement uh, uh, software. So you thought uh, from being an accountant, moving into IT would make the conversations more interesting? Well, what's going on with that? Um, it's funny, this is the first time I've ever been in IT. I've always ever been in finance functions and um, I must admit the IT guys are a little bit easier for me to get along with than the uh, finance <laughs> people. But um, if anyone from work sees this, I'll be in trouble now. <laughs> so what sort of budgets have you been dealing with over your career? What, what size of budget? Uh, so the project at the moment uh, is a sort of three-year project and we're up around uh, north of 100 million uh, in terms of the project. Uh, the one at Deakin was around the th uh, 20 to 30 million dollar mark. 
Um, so running big teams of 100, 150 people, uh, vendors and suppliers and managing those relationships as well. And it's amazing that, you know, how much, and it, it's something that Grandma Sadea, you know, we talk uh, a lot about, you know, what, what's going on at work and the relativity of what happens in Taekwondo and the, you know, what we, what we do and, and, what, and our morals and our, you know, the student oath and, uh, and the like, applying that to everyday work. And it's amazing that um, those things hold you in such great stead in the professional landscape. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, I, I thought you were going somewhere else with that, actually, and, and thinking about you, the budgets that you deal with at work relative to the budgets that we've dealt with, even internationally in Taekwondo, right? It just dwarfs them. But yes, the other side of it, of having the, the values and things from Taekwondo and how they just change your life, really, and become a, a huge part of who we are, right? Uh, absolutely, and you know, so a lot of people would sit there and see the integrity and the, you know, running a big project. You know, we've got a whole lot of stakeholders that are already or always concerned about what we're doing, but just that perseverance, just to put to there you know, that one foot in front of the other, uh, and, and deal with people with with a level of integrity that you know a lot of people don't get in other workplaces. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you balance that? You know, you take one the life and take one all together with a full time job and family, and six kids. Um, Six kids. Yeah, six kids. You know kids. what causes it, right? <laughs> we might talk after <laughs> this. Um, uh, it, it is a balance and, and forever it, it's, you know, you're sort of having a life of, you know, 15 minute increments of what you're doing and where you need to be and, and, and the like. But, um, you know, certainly COVID uh, helped uh, in that regard. So I was certainly working from home helps. And so I try and work from home Monday and Wednesday. That means I can be at the dojang at time to open up and, and take class. And, and, you know, just love teaching, you know, especially the kids, you know, we've got some great kids that are, uh, are in the club and, and adults as well. But, um, you know, the kids and the way that they just come to class and put in every day and, and, and it really gives you energy. And watching them grow and develop too is really cool, eh? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so some of the, the students here, you know, you sit there and go, well, how old are they? Are they oh, 24? It's like... God, remember when they were like five, six years old. Yeah, it just means how we're getting older, mate. <laughs> it's scary, scary. I can't remember who I was talking to that was telling me, um, somebody in our various travels, that they started teaching the grandchildren of their students, <laughs> of their original students. It's scary stuff. Eh? Can you tell me how um, have you been involved in the establishment of One Legacy International Taekwondo Federation? Yeah, absolutely. So certainly been supporting Grandma Sadaya in terms of the setup of the organisation. So been involved... Uh, in the uh, soon to be launched or launched website uh, and the background in that website is I think really exciting something that you know I haven't experienced in terms of the ITF world before uh, and really starting to support uh, instructors in terms of content and how they teach and, and relate to their students uh, and online content that can really help and develop a, a, an organisation or a club. Um, so certainly helping out with that side of it, but largely uh, you know, the, the main part of it is really setting up the constitution of the new organisation um, so that we have the, that transparency, uh, that we have that value exchange uh, and fair value exchange in terms of the way we interact with you know, grandmasters, masters, uh, you know, instructors and the students and members. And, and I think that's really important. I think um, you know, if, if we think about as masters who wear you know, standing on the shoulders of, it's our grandmasters, and they've got so much to offer and give and, and, and provide support and advice and counsel, like I mentioned before. Um, and, and I think that would be repeated across the grandmaster community across the world. Uh, and I think we've, we've lost a, a, our way in terms of that, and I think we need, to, we need to give those people the due respect that they deserve. Well, can you tell me then, how is One Legacy going to be different? And, and why, why has it been necessary to establish the One Legacy International Taekwondo Federation? Uh, I certainly think about, uh, you know, transparency uh, and, and understanding, you know, that we and an organisation is here for the members. Uh, we, we, an organisation doesn't, doesn't exist if it doesn't have members. Mm. Uh, and I think, I think, you know, personally, the ITF may have lost the way a little bit in terms of that. So I think putting that value exchange to be fair between the organisation and the members, that they have a say, that there's absolute transparency and there's services that can really enhance what they're doing in terms of their, their training and their clubs and their organisations. That value is at the heart of, I think, that's what's going to be different. 
Right, you're understanding who your customer is and making sure you're servicing and providing value to those customers. So making it all about the members rather than about the administration, that, that's going to be a significant change, isn't it? And a really exciting one. Absolutely. Uh, what will, will your role be? in the new organisation? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, so I'll, uh, I'll be putting myself forward as the treasurer um, for the new, new organisation. I hope, you know, um, people can uh, support me in, in that endeavour. Um, I've certainly been, you know, have a background in looking after, I think since 2002, two three, I've been in either the treasurer or the secretary general role in, in Australia for the National Association. Uh, and in the last sort of uh, five, six years, I've been uh, involved in the Audit Risk and Compliance Committee for the ITF. Um, so I think that holds me in good, good stead in terms of being able to pick up that treasurer role and be able to make, and, and yeah, bring to life that transparency that we talked about earlier. Well, I think even more than that, you know, the professional background you said before, you're a CPA. You know, having, having a, a trained chartered accountant as your treasurer is a, is a really important thing because you understand how these things should be done and you can deliver that transparency to the members uh, rather than a, in many traditional sports organisations. It's just some volunteer that's, that's offered to do the job, right? Yeah. And good luck to them. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's, it's difficult work, but it, you know, it's got to be that integrity and transparency and, and, and the opportunity for people to ask questions. I think that's really important. I think, um, you know, so that, that it's not just a download of this is what we're doing and this is the answer. You know, here's where we are at and the opportunity to ask questions and really challenge in terms of the, the, that duty, I think is really important. And having someone capable of answering those questions, having somebody with that professional capability. Yeah, right. Excellent. Um, how will you, you mentioned this a little bit before, and we've got to wind up a little bit now, but I, I want to ask you a little bit about the experience that the, uh, the masters and grandmasters, the instructors, the members are going to have in one legacy. Yeah, I think uh, there's something really different that um, Grandmaster Daya has envisaged through one legacy. And, and you know, uh, many of us have been involved with Taekwondo for a very, very long time. We get courses when they come to the region. It's probably the only interaction that we get, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere with the ITF. Um, but what we're doing is being able to have our students and our instructor, instructors having access to content. You know, how many times do we sit there and say, oh, how do we do this punch? What's this? What's that? How do we do this? You know, and the mechanics of those movements will be explained and delivered as part of a membership to everyone that's interested. And so they can consume in their own time, they can develop and bring their clubs and their members and their students along the journey rather than having to wait two years to go to a course. We've had this technology for a long time now, right? So make the most of it and have the, the content available to everyone. Yeah, and uh, what, what about their website? What are the other functionality is there going to be on the website to make things easier for members? Yeah, absolutely. So certainly, you know, really excited about the website in terms of interaction with the members, interaction with the organisation. I think at times, um, you know, it's very difficult to be able to have a really good customer experience in dealing with these international bodies. Um, we want to be able to make it a really good customer experience for all people coming into the, into the website and get what they need to without having to jump through a thousand hoops to be able to get to from A to B. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time, Master Harper. I'm going to step away and thank give you, you more work Mark. to do. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to invite Cindy up and you're going to interview her. Great. Yeah, good for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Here's your shoe. Oh, thank you. Hello. Hello, Master Hopper. Hello, Cindy. How are you? Uh, not too well at the moment. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> this is definitely not my thing. <laughs> we'll be fine. Yes. All right, we'll be fine. Um, firstly, first question for you. How did you get involved in all of this? Um, you know, I've, I've, I've known you for a while now. Um, you were involved in, in the background a little bit and then you started training. How did that all come about? So I started with working with Grandmaster Daha in 2017. Um, I think I was hired at that time to help with the organising committee for the ITF World Cup. Um, I don't really know. And, and you know, let's talk about the World Cup for a little bit. I mean, that was a huge undertaking yes. and an, an amazing event. Yep. 
Um, you know, if I sit here and think about what happened, what's happened in the ITF over the last sort of 22 years since we've been with this group, I think there's been only two events in the Southern Hemisphere. I'll take Argentina away, because Argentina's probably a, a, a little bit away, but, you know, in terms of New Zealand and Australia, there have been two events, and that event was an amazing success. And you were a key part of the preparation and delivery of that event. Yep. How did you feel after it was all done? Oh, very relieved, that's for sure. Um, yeah, it was a lot of hard work. I mean, there, it was such a good team. Everyone worked so well together, and yeah, it was really good. Yep. It was. It was an, a, an amazing, amazing event. Um, so, given your involvement in the World Cup, yep. we're now doing something pretty amazing ourselves. Yes, we are. And. How have you been involved and what, what, what have you been doing in terms of One Legacy? Um, very, very, very much. So <laughs> I actually haven't stopped for months. Um, every, uh, working on the website, um, creating the content, um, pretty much everything besides what you've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> so. And, you know, so I, I reflect on the last couple of months yep. and, you know, in the, in the culmination of landing in today and all the conversations that we've had along that journey, yep. uh, you know, from website mm -hmm. uh, to design of certificates to Logo. design of merchandise to design of logos yep. um, to how we, we how will we interact with the website in all the different ways in terms of content in terms of gradings how we record new students and members um, it's a big big job and so how we, how is it you know sleeping four hours a night <laughs> yeah no I'm actually very very relieved that we're here today and that it's almost you know, ready to roll. So, very excited, very relieved and excited. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And so, in terms of the go forward, what's your role going to be in, in One Legacy uh, after today? Yes. So, I've been appointed as the Secretary General. Um, my role is going to be very, very busy. Yep. Um, I think with the experience that I've had so far with ITF Australia, um, and, you know, working, working with the ITF, um, I have the knowledge that I need to be able to deliver as the Secretary General. Yep. And I think you do too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to this. We're going to see some fundamental movements from Taekwondo. Uh, sir, please take it away.
Okay, this video here has been filmed 1980, 82, 83. Basically in uh, West Stride, number 15, Raider Road, West Stride. I still remember the place. That's why you don't have to see any. One of the boys there, actually they two brothers, not this one, the one before. Unfortunately, one of them, still, one of them have died well, about six years ago. But his brother still alive. I think here you will see one of those, uh, Maria Mujalli. He's no longer active. Also, you see Mustafa Al Sheikh, but there's not really, yeah, he's a little bit more bigger than where he was. We're not going to point out to him. That's how we used to train in the early days. Technique have changed a lot since then. That's what I used to have a hair anyway. That was actually was the first full-time Santa I have was 1982. Yeah, when you look at the technique, what we're doing today, and then what we was doing in the early days, you can see the huge difference with our movement, with our body momentum, and also our stance as well. Now, obviously, when I want to do some laughing, I put those, one of those videos to have a look the way we used to do it. Also, that exercise we're doing right now, I think we, we call it horror exercise, correct, is uh, Lorenzo. That exercise no longer exists. That's a very dangerous exercise. We don't do it anymore. But I don't know, unfortunately, it's, that's where we, I don't know, we, we create a flexibility in that early days. And somehow I'm lucky, probably I'm the only person left practicing on the floor. The majority of the people used to practice with me or we used to be together in the same, in the same class. It's not many of them still alive or retired or dead. I'm not sure what's happening, but anyway. As God gave me good health, I'm still going. I'll probably go on for another 20 years, continue practicing. Some people have to put up with me. And unfortunately, it's the way he is alive. Some people would love to put up with me. Some people don't like to put up with me because I used to call me, I'm the brutal instructor. But I used to train him very well when we used to train for the world championship. We used to take him to the beach in North Narabin in August, and they have to swim with the uniform, and they have to practice with the uniform. I used to carry some rock in my pocket. When they don't swim, I just hit them with the rock. Air Trevor and Mustafa and Jao Kamis and Jao Sairoti. Our particular, probably Jao Sairoti would remember that. My son was about eight years old and he just walked next to the water. I said, John, get out of the water, a little bit cold. And Jao Sairoti looked at me and said, You put us in the water and then you worry about your son, that his food got to get wet. It's correct, Jao. That's Maria Mujalli. He's supposed to be here today, but obviously he's not anymore. Okay, that's what we used to do. A huge difference from what we do then and what we're doing today. Thank you, Master. You're most welcome. We're back. <laughs> That's now, you to turn the tables on me, aren't you? Now it's my turn. Now <laughs> it's my turn. Um, welcome, Master Benisevich. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming over the ditch, as they say. Oh, 
it's always great. I've, it's been years since I've been to Sydney, so it's really great to come back. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, great to have you here. Um, I'm going to turn the tables a little bit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. I, I started Taekwondo actually around the time you got your first degree in 1989. Uh, my instructor was Paul McPhail, now Grandmaster Paul McPhail. Uh, and right from the word go, just loved it and went full in, as many of us did, right? So I was training, I think, when, is it, when I was at high school, about four nights a week, not going to multiple schools to do that, but Grandma McPhail was running two clubs, and I was at training both those clubs. Uh, expanded out, uh, went to every event, went to every tournament, and then uh, when I went to university, I ended up, as university students, you know, you're really incredibly busy with all this free time on your hands, right? So I ended up spending a lot of time with Grandmaster McFarl working on things like the national syllabus uh, and you know, reading through the encyclopedia and saying, but what about this? We haven't got this in the, in the syllabus. So we, he was uh, doing desktop publishing at the time, so we created a lot of that work. And over the years, we've done a number of projects writing books. Uh, I would then... I think around 2004, we had a traditional organisation where you had your executive committee, right, which a lot of sports organisations used to have. Uh, and I was instrumental in driving that away from those traditional structures and into a board of directors structure, which is when I kind of got an interest in governance. Uh, 2005, I think, or 2001, I went to my first World Championships. Uh, but I, I was never really a strong competitor. I was one of those guys that didn't really like getting my head kicked in. So I got involved in the background stuff. Uh, so the first World Champs I went to in Rimini in 2001, I was helping Grandmaster Boss. And my now wife, then girlfriend, she came with me and she was on the organising team as well. Uh, she was running the VIPs around as a yellow belt, having, you know, Grandmaster Rigi Haas talk to her and they're saying, oh, I don't know who that person is. <laughs> Uh, I, I think, in fact, um, Grandmaster Georgia Hua said, gee, your English is fantastic. And she said, you should hear my Italian, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, but we were running around, you know, organising all the, the mats and all that kind of stuff and, um, and letting athletes into another ring. And then I did my first one as an umpire in 2005 and never looked back because, you know, the family you were talking about before, just seeing everyone around the world. Uh, actually lived here in Sydney for a couple of years in the early 2000s. Uh, because I came over for work and trained every week with Grandmaster Daha and, you know, that was an amazing time. Uh, and Grandmaster Daha helped me get onto the ITF board, of which I sat on for the last four years. Uh, but at the end of it, you know, training all the time, just loved what I was doing. Got my seventh degree, I can't remember whether it was 2018, 2019 in Spain. Uh, took, went for a month, took the family. Um, so, yeah, just Brilliant. been a long history. Love Brilliant. It. And... Good segue in terms of question. From a professional perspective, what's your professional background? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, I, th I think um, Grandmaster Daha say, would say I'm a professional pain in his ass, uh, but there's probably a little bit more to it than that. I did my university degrees in commerce and law. Uh, I had the opportunity to start my career in consulting, and I had the choice of either qualifying as a, an accountant or qualifying as a lawyer. And qualifying as an accountant was two more years of study, and at the time qualifying as a lawyer was three months of nine to five, nine to three, and then go to the pub. So I qualified as a lawyer, uh, but I always thought I had too much integrity to be a lawyer, so I never worked as one. Uh, and so I was consulting for about five years. That's what brought me over here uh, for a couple of years. And then I had an opportunity to run a business back in New Zealand, back in Auckland. So I, I ran that for about six years. Uh, then moved into financial services, which is the industry I work in now. Uh, and I did a few years at our financial markets regulator, the Financial Markets Authority. I came through that part of my career as an analyst, so as a pr principal intelligence analyst. Oh. Uh, best That's title a title. I, best title I've ever had. And in fact, one experience that I had was fantastic. I, I worked, we work in a building, the, the FMA is the Financial Markets Authority, and the building uh, that we work in is, is two kind of towers with a, an arch over the top. Uh, so you kind of walk through in the middle there, and my boss uh, one day, who was the head of strategic intelligence, he introduced me to the person who started the Crime Stoppers in New Zealand, and this guy, John Pelham. He was uh, walking from the other end in a fedora and trench coat with the light behind him, and I just felt, now I'm in intelligence. You know, this is how this works. Um, but did that for a few years. That's the equivalent of ASIC that you have here or the FCA in the UK, SEC. Uh, I've, I've worked the last seven years in life insurance in a company that's owned by the same company that owns Tel here in Australia, Partners oh, yeah. Life. Yes. Um, and I do a lot of work helping uh, advice businesses who've just transitioned in the law understand how to run a business, what is a business, uh, understanding governance, compliance, those sorts of things. So that, that's – and then I do a lot of work in the industry. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of the day job. And the parallels between what you, you've learnt in your Taekwondo career versus 
it's, your professional career? Yeah, it's actually been quite crazy because of, I think largely because of the work that I've done with Grandmaster McPhail over the years, I ended up with a really bizarre skill set. Uh, I edited the New Zealand magazine for seven years, so I ended up with some skill in, in desktop publishing software. Uh, a friend and I did a television show in New Zealand for a few years, so editing TV, uh, comparing our own stuff, uh, also the relationships with the television companies, like, we just did all that stuff, right? You know, in Taekwondo, it's a small <laughs> group, so you do everything. You do everything. Um, so that gave me a crazy set of skills that I've carried through my career, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. And in terms of One Legacy, What's your role going to be in One Legacy? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I, you know, after 34 years in Taekwondo, uh, towards the end of the last year, I've, you know, like you, full-time day job, I'd end up doing 20 or 30 hours a week of Taekwondo on top. And I got to the end of last year and decided it was time for my kids to, to meet me uh, and, and actually handed my school on to somebody else uh, and spent a lot more time with family and, uh, and decided that, you know, I, that was it for a bit. Um, I resigned from the board uh, and then Grandmaster Daha when he was over in March asked me uh, for help. Now when I lived here around the early 2000s for a couple of years, Grandmaster Daha was amazing to me. Uh, as I say I, I lived in Bondi Junction which is in the eastern suburbs. Uh, I'd go to Parramatta after work for training and then at the end of training one of him or one of his guys would drop me at the train station but there were even occasions when he'd drive me home back to the, the Bondi Junction because it got too late. And being a Kiwi, we don't pay for our roads in New Zealand, which is why our roads are shit. Uh, whereas, I, so it wasn't until I went home that I realised that Grandma Sadaha must have paid a fortune in tolls taking me back and forward to Bondi Junction on a regular basis. And it's just that sort of thing that he does and he doesn't even think about. And so I really owe Grandma Sadaha a lot, a huge amount. And so when he asked me for help with this, this project, you know, I'm all in. Fantastic. And we love having you here. Now, I know that you have a, a third career in terms of podcasts, YouTube career, and it's about governance. And can you share uh, a little bit in terms of what is governance and, and, and then how it relates to what we're looking, well, what we're doing? Yeah, sure. And I think to start one step back, uh, the reason that, that podcast came about is I was up for re-election for a board. Uh, and the board that I was up for re-election on actually didn't know anything about governance. You know, an organisation where people, well-meaning, passionate people were running the show, but weren't governing. And I was incredibly frustrated in the board meetings trying to say, this is what we need to be doing for governance. And when I came up for re-election, I thought, well, bugger it, I know a lot of directors. I know a lot of executives. I'm just going to ask them if I can have a quick chat and chuck it on YouTube. And that's kind of how it began. Uh, in the end, I loved it so much, I kept doing it. So I've got a, still got a list of about 20 or 30 people to interview. I've got topics coming up the wazoo. Uh, so I'm just going to keep doing it. And it's, it's funny because my son, has, he says he wants to be a YouTuber, but he's a lazy 14-year-old and won't do any work. So, mate, I am a YouTuber. I've just got to get a sponsor so I can you know, pay for itself. Uh, but the, the whole idea of you know, talking to, as I say, experienced directors, experienced executives about what governance is, uh, to a large extent, you know, it hasn't been anything new, uh, but the conversations have been really, really interesting. And now governance is, I tend to think of an organisation in three levels. The first level is your directors, your governance. Uh, the second level is your operations. And then in support, you've got compliance. Uh, compliance is making sure that all the operations are happening as you expect, so there's no surprises for the organisation. Really the buck stops with the directors, the board of directors, and, and their job of governance is oversight of the organisation. The Institute of Directors in New Zealand describes four pillars. Uh, the first pillar is determining purpose, why the organisation exists. The second is around establishing a good culture of governance. The third is a key one is holding management to account. Uh, and then the fourth is around effective compliance. Uh, the problem that you see in many organisations is essentially management become the board and they, they don't get their eyes out of the weeds. Uh, this, this element of determining purpose, why does the organisation exist? What is the vision? What is the strategy of the organisation? That's got to be the starting point and the focus. And then from there, they need to be thinking about, well, okay, if this is our strategy, if this is why we exist, what could stop us from achieving that? And so that's around risk management. Risk, yep. uh, and so identifying what the risks could be and if they were to go wrong, how would we deal with them? And organisations that don't do that well fail. Yep. And I'm, I'm really keen that One Legacy International Taekwondo Federation sets that up well at the start. And so you can separate 
governance from management. The day-to-day -day stuff has to happen, it's essential, but it doesn't go into the boardroom. The boardroom is about setting the purpose, um, making sure that the risk is managed, and ensuring that the compliance happens and everything operational is happening as expected, holding management to account. Excellent. It's about the different lenses and the different purposes of the different roles, and they all come together to create you know, something that's quite special. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, everyone's got their different part to play, and when everyone works together and, and does their role well, you have an organisation that thrives. Uh, and it's so essential to ensure that you have the right people in those jobs that have the right knowledge. And I, I you know, this, sports is, a, is a, an area where quite commonly sports people float their way to the top and no one ever teaches them what governance is and they think they know what they're doing and it's, it's about how much you don't know and not knowing what you don't know. And it's incredibly frustrating when you have senior people in a board like that that refuse to listen and learn. You know, the general says never, never tire of learning. That doesn't just apply to kicking and punching. That applies to all of your life. So true. Um, so given that, how should governance be performed at One Legacy? It's a, it's a really good question. And I think it all comes down to the starting point of separating the board of directors from management. You've got to have a management team that run the day-to-day, -day, your secretarial stuff, managing, you're running your finances, and they need to be reporting to the board of directors. The board of directors, well, th there's a common saying uh, in governance of uh, eyes in, tr of trotters out. Uh, so, you know, you, you're not, you're not it got your fingers in the day-to-day, -day. You, you're looking over the top and, and, and supporting, and I think that's very much where it's essential that One Legacy goes. Uh, this work, you can work with the management team to set the vision, you can set all the frameworks in place with management, but ultimately you stand back, they report to you, ask questions and probe. And having a diverse team of people on that board with different skill sets, you know, having some finance skill on the board, having some legal skill, having some business skill on the board, some marketing skill, um, all of those things together so that you can support management and help them with, with, uh, with what they need to do. And I think if you get the right people on the board that can offer that support and then the right doers in the organisation to make it happen, then you've got an organisation that can really thrive. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, really excited to, to be on this journey with you, as I'm sure Grandmaster Dea is too. Um, we're going to hand over to some... Zoom yeah, I, interviews. I think um, Grandmaster we... Daha's got some uh, conversations with some people that are from ah. other parts of the world that couldn't make it physically. Yes. yes. Uh, so we're gonna yeah we're gonna watch those now. So please um, enjoy the, the next couple of interviews, guys. Thank you, Master Harper. Thank you, Master Benisovic. in the new organization, but we understand. I'll ask you a couple of questions. Why yeah. inspire you to pursue our legal career in the realm of Taekwondo? Well, um, it all started. I was, a, I was a practicing lawyer in Sydney. And at that time, the ITF was trying to establish itself in Australia. Um, the organization had been plagued by a lot of factional infighting between senior members and um, and that was stunting its growth opportunities and its ability to become firmly established. So I was approached by General Choi um, to take on the role of president of the International Taekwondo Federation of Australia um, with a view to trying to unify and bring together the warring factions and, uh, and create a platform for growth of the organisation in Australia. When you were the President of Australia? Uh, I was President of the ITF uh, National Governing Body in Australia for about seven years, just prior to the year 2000. Good. When you been the President of ITF in Australia, what were, what were your challenges in the future? Uh, by far the biggest challenge I faced at that time was bringing the warring factions and the senior members of ITF together. It was a very frustrating time as some of the senior members had direct links to people in the international body 
and were operating outside the Australian national body. And um, they weren't making any contribution either to Australia or to the international body. And it proved a very challenging exercise to try and get everybody to basically play by the same rules. And um, it would have been a lot easier if, if certain people in the international body weren't uh, engaging in the destabilising uh, conduct. But um, eventually we were able to overcome most of that and, and get the organisation properly structured in Australia. Tell us about your interaction with General Shoy. Um, look, one of the... Um, you know, one of the things with trying to get people to obey the rules was was General Choi's set of principles. He laid out the five tenets of Taekwondo, uh, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, indomitable spirit. I believe these are great principles and great values to help guide you in any aspect of your life, any person at all. And um, I found many senior practitioners in Australia and in the international organisation seem to have lost sight of those tenants. And um, whenever I had any dispute that I had to mediate or, or get in the middle of, I just fell back on those five wonderful principles, those five tenets of Taekwondo. And uh, I used those as the platform to guide me in in adjudicating any dispute um as um as i got to know general Choi, um you can't help but be inspired by his commitment his passion um and it was an important time for general Choi as he was very committed to having taekwondo included as an olympic sport and at that time, there were two main international organisations um, ruling Taekwondo around the, around the globe. There was the original International Taekwondo Federation, which was run by General Choi, and there had been a breakaway movement which had formed into the World Taekwondo Federation, which over the years had become very firmly established on the international scene as well. Before Taekwondo could be included as an Olympic discipline, the International Olympic Committee determined that the two international factions would have to come together and um, establish a unified set of rules for competition and ensure that all practitioners of Taekwondo were available for selection uh, for, a, for Olympic competition. Um, with that in mind, General Choi as I got to know him, he invited me to join the Taekwondo Unification Committee. And we were fortunate in that the work we did, which was very much led and, um, and inspired by General Choi, ultimately succeeded in having Taekwondo included in the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Do you have any other fond memory with General Choi? Yeah, I'm not sure how you define fond memory. Um, I recall on a number of occasions, I, I had the pleasure of staying in the same hotel as General Choi in an adjoining room. And I remember on, on those occasions, I was always awoken very early hours of the morning as the general went through his morning routine and there was just a large number of systematic bangings and pounding on the walls or down pipes or um, some other bit of apparatus as the general went through his, um, his morning routine. Um, no one, I don't think, certainly not me, but I don't think anybody else had the, uh, had the nerve to suggest the general change his morning routine when he was staying in hotels. But, um, he was, um, look, as I got to know him, he was a great inspiration and a man that I, I very fondly admired. In ensuring the fair comp competition and athletic warfare in Taekwondo tournament? Yeah, look, I think uh, as there's obviously some legal things that, that are involved in establishing an organisation, but I think in the martial arts and particularly in Taekwondo, 
it's my opinion that it's the development of the right culture that will determine the success and value of the students. And as always, the strength of an organisation's culture will depend very much and almost entirely on its leadership. And, um, and we go back again to those five tenets of Taekwondo. I think if you use those as your guiding light, um, then the, the culture of the organisation can be assured to be as strong as it can possibly be. Um, I think each Taekwondo organisation is responsible for developing its own culture and being part of an international organisation which has the best technical training available, uh, like One Legacy does, and a commitment to focusing on and promoting the strong personal values of Taekwondo, I think that's a great framework and a guiding light. I think it's about the best you can have in the, uh, in the world of martial arts. Um, as, as a legal counsel, I get to play an, in, uh, an integral support role in the development um, of a governance and, uh, and framework um, that allows for fair and healthy competition. competition. Uh, we always have to be concerned about anti-doping and uh, we also have to ensure that we develop policies to protect our athletes' welfare. So I do get to play a role to that supporting role to some extent, but as I said, I think it's the development of the organisation's culture that is the underpinning strength of any organisation. As a second degree, and how do you balance your personal passion for Taekwondo and your responsibility for legal? Yes, it was an interesting journey. I, I was a lawyer first and, and then took on the administration role as president of ITF. Um, I'd always had a very keen interest in, in learning martial arts, but um, I was spending most of my time in other sporting pursuits. Um, until I met General Choi and uh, I was introduced to the art of Taekwondo and, uh, and then I met your good self. Um, I think at that time you were a, a third degree and um, we shared a, a very similar geographical location for our respective businesses. Um, I know your family came from a war-torn area of the world and of necessity, you were always um, a young, bit of a hot-headed fighter. And, uh, and I know from in investigating your history that you were lucky enough to find a very good instructor who helped you control the rage within and bring some discipline and meaning into your life. I think one of the most inspiring things for me I, I witnessed you engage a young man who was literally in, in an alcoholic stupor night after night after night and, and often just sitting in the gutter. And, um, and you bothered to take this young man under your wing. You uh, investigated that he'd been subject to a hideous trauma in his life and he was looking to escape the harshness of reality by delving into drugs and alcohol. I saw you take this young man under his under your wing and in doing so, you got him into training, got him out of the pub and, um, and, and in doing so, turned his life around. Um, this man trained with you, I trained with him. Um, I got to know him well. He later served his country as a commando in the armed forces. And, um, and now this not so young man continues to serve his community as a Taekwondo instructor specializing in young children. So he's paying it back. It, it's been an inspiring journey and something that, that wouldn't have happened had you not taken him under your wing, introduced him to, to some hard training and, um, and in doing so just transformed his life completely. Um, I think more than, more than anything to do with the law, I saw this as a demonstration of great healing. And I firmly believe that there was, if there was more healing in the world, there'd be a lot less need for lawyers. Uh, well, I want to take this opportunity and thank you very much, you know, for this interview. It's my last question to you, and I know you're always a very honest person when you answer a question. How do you find out 
our friendship over the, over the 35 years? Well, I think the, um, the my initial experience that I've just described of how you turned this, this young man around, this, this now not so young man became a lifelong friend of mine and um and i remember something else i said to you one day when we were talking about the struggling finances involved as a as a martial arts um, instructor and i said to you with all your passion with all your dedication and with with all your commitment it's a pity you you didn't um train for tennis or golf because you would have been a multi-millionaire with that, um, with that obsession, that passion, that commitment. And I remember the words you said to me very clearly. You said, well, how would that have helped anybody? I couldn't have helped people change their life if I was, if I was playing tennis or golf. And, um, and I think that probably um, inspired me as much as I've ever been inspired to do anything and be involved in anything ever before. So it's been a wonderful journey Michael, and um, it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege for me to be able to be part of it with you. Thank you very much, Roy. Thank you very much for your time and your effort, and hopefully we will go continue again surfing our community, surfing our members with honesty and integrity. It's been an absolute pleasure, Michael. Hi, Colin.
Hello, sir. How are you? I'm sorry you cannot be with us here today, but it's all right. You can deal with the situation. Have a great time. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Khalid. No worries, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hello. I am uh, Khalid Barlam. Uh, I work uh, as a production manager and creative agency. I have long experience in media. It's been now over 23 years. I worked over uh, a few platforms. I worked in social media and websites and also in TV channels, producing content for media, so media content, basically. And I worked in, in different sectors, including documentaries and news and also fiction as well. Right. OK. And what? Yes, sir. What does that one that mean to you, Colin? So, uh, firstly, I would also describe myself as a passionate, uh, as a passionate practitioner of this discipline, and I would love to be an advocate also for for Taekwondo. I would dedicate uh, everything to work for promoting this discipline and to be part of this uh, family of uh, Taekwondo. I am. Uh, I've been practicing since uh, since I remember. Since I was a child, I was eight years old. And uh, when it comes to Taekwondo, Taekwondo to me is more than uh, physical strength. It's more than uh, uh, improvement of of the techniques and stuff. It's also a discipline. It's also about respect. It's also mental strength. And overall, it's gathering us regardless of our differences and and everything happening between uh, human uh, across the globe taekwondo is one umbrella that gathers everyone and these disciplines how can this how can this media help this organization for it uh, absolutely media is uh, everywhere it's in uh, in the promotion of products media is in uh, advertising media is in describing uh, anything, any product, any uh, uh, governmental or non-profit or, or any site. And here in Taekwondo specifically, it plays a crucial role because the, the purpose is very noble in here. It hides many things and it, it develops human as, uh, as human. So media can showcase the benefits, the actual benefits of, of Taekwondo and the dedication of all uh, practitioners uh, all this can happen through documentaries, through uh, competitions, educational content, uh, and bring this discipline to the mainstream and inspire generations. So, yes, sir. What are the challenges? Well, the challenges are actually many, and if I will name few, I would name like the, the two main ones uh, now see the population of the whole world is is different different when it comes to to their culture different when it comes to their uh, standards their values or the way they describe values from one place to another so the method of advertising or of delivering this content should be also different or should also uh, like consider these sensitivities wherever we are advertising something like uh, I'll give examples for this. So for example, if you do an, an event where you have a mixed group, for example, in specific areas or countries in the Middle East, this could raise lots of questions. People would criticize the way how they are seeing this advertised 
and they will not look at the at the core of uh, of our content of what we are trying to to deliver actually and such and such that's uh, like the the difference and in, in values around the world the other thing is in few places now in the world and that's been happening for like since humanity started uh, there are conflicts there are people disagreeing like this can happen between a small group or a big group or, or everything. Uh, this is where Taekwondo should never get stuck. We are with, with everyone. This is the message we should deliver in Taekwondo. Uh, regardless of whatever happening, our disciplines and our values are the same. And that's what gather people around us. And media should do the same job, should keep the base, should keep what we are actually uh, working on spreading. How do you feel about uh, One Legacy International Taekwondo Federation? One Legacy, I personally, I don't feel that One Legacy uh, is just starting. I feel like it's it's the actual Taekwondo that's been going on uh, since the founder uh, started practicing Taekwondo and found this uh, organization. So the, the true, how to say, uh, the true values and what taekwondo uh, like why was it there is the one legacy okay when you when you and i we start talking about forming you know the one legacy what's your impression then i was like uh how to say i was like so happy about this and uh like to be honest i saw this coming i saw this coming uh because of because of everything because of all the current circumstances i won't go in details but taekwondo should never uh, be centric about uh how to say a specific group or a specific area in the world it should do the same everywhere we should work about improving uh, taekwondo everywhere and and delivering uh what's happening so i keep speaking from media perspective but uh, actually, if you have if you have such an improvement in a place that should affect the place where Taekwondo is not practiced very well, same as uh, few countries, they should actually help them improve in this. And we should work on linking uh, everyone. So when I when I heard this, I felt like now the actual work will start. Now we're, we're not going to have boundaries we are not going to have uh, limits to this that's a great thank you Holodist. uh we look forward to work together uh under the one legacy international taekwondo federation to promoting the art of taekwondo to promoting general show legacy and i'm sure that will be very well received by everyone around the world and also especially in the middle east thank you so much sir thank you for this interview the the great pleasure is mine actually and yeah, I'll, I'll remember this uh, this moment uh, as long as I live. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Hey, hey, gone. Okay, hey, you don't see this very often. <laughs> <laughs> and I, John, I know you cannot be with us on that historic event, but I'm sure we're gonna have a great day, and we'll let you know about it, or you see it on, basically, on live streaming. Just tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi, and uh, how you how you going? And I'm sorry I can't be at the uh, the the opening of the event. Um, but yeah, a little bit about myself. I'm currently a fourth degree in Taekwondo. I have a small school on the Gold Coast that consists of some very loyal and dedicated members that make the training enjoyable. I also work full time as a building manager for a fantastic building company uh, that builds uh, houses. Um, I've been there for the last 20 years. Uh, I'm also a father to two young girls, five and eight years of age. Uh, they have very constant demands and attention. And I'm also a husband to, to one uh, <laughs> that I can, that I know of. Uh, I still find, uh, still manage to find time for myself occasionally, uh, which helps to keep me sane. Um, I also 
currently part of a non-profit organisation called the Sunshine Coast in Queensland Taekwondo, where we have a vision to make Taekwondo more affordable to those less fortunate and reward those that will help us succeed in our quest. So that's just a real basic rundown of myself. All right, we go back a long way. Just tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, well, um, I first met yourself, Grandmaster Dale, in 1990. Seems like a long, long time ago now. Uh, I was a yellow belt. I was training with a small club on the northern beaches in New South Wales with my brother and my girlfriend, who is now my wife. Uh, the instructor of the club was having some personal issues and she called upon you to help with that club as she was uh, having some major issues. Um, you arranged for one of your dedicated black belts, Warren Webb, to take over. And he was fantastic. He made us feel really welcome. And um, he opened the doors for us to be able to see what we we're actually missing. And not long after that, we moved across to your club. Uh, and then it just grew from there. Uh, I was attracted to the passion and kindness um, so that you, from when you helped everyone. And from there, we developed a great bond and a friendship. And then that's where it led us to where we are now. What were you taught when you when we start talking about forming the new organisation? Uh, it didn't come as much of a surprise uh, after speaking to you on several occasions over the phone and just um, seeing and sensing the frustrations and disappointment in the, the in your words. Um, regarding the organisation organization we belonged to and how it had changed so much from what it was when General Choi was alive. It had become very difficult just to be part of and many had lost faith. Uh, but when you proposed to start this new organisation that would be based on the original organisation that was all once loved, from there... Um, you managed to get the support from some very dedicated professionals in countries from around the world uh, that will no doubt see the rebirthing of Taekwondo and make it accessible to many who have not been able to join due to the many hurdles and rising costs. I look forward to this new adventure and I will be assisting where I can to make it great. Okay, I'm going to try one question to you from from my side. Uh, as you know me for so many years, John, you know I'm very dedicated to John Shorey legacy and John Shorey life. Uh, and I can promise you that organization has only got to serve the members with honesty and integrity and democracy. And that organization will go for a long way. What you thought on that vision? Yeah, again, that's just one of the things that we probably shared for so long um, is being able to be there for, for members for and being able to have uh, the voice that you can that you have by being loved by so many people from around the world, um, making this accessible to them to make Taekwondo enjoyable like it should be and not be part of a um, institution that you just govern by rules and regulations. It just makes it un unenjoyable. Uh, and I, I, I commend you on, on what you're doing. It's a massive job. It's going to require a lot of money, support, um, giving up your own time, your own life has to go on hold to get this thing up and running, uh, you've got my full support, as you know, always. Okay, thank you, John. Let's get into it. No problem. <laughs>
straight to the side, double it up. Whoop. Back again, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr McIntyre uh, to the uh, interview stage. Um, we've known uh, each other for quite a while, um, but wondering if you could share how you began this journey. Uh, you're a sixth degree in Newcastle. How did you start? Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Master. Um, <clears throat> First met uh, Grandmaster in uh, 1988 when I was a, a blue belt at a tournament with my instructor. Uh, always been involved in competition myself. Um, I think that was in the, in, the, in the 80s. If you're a competitor, most of the time you're an umpire as well. So that's where my umpiring uh, passion started, even as, at a blue belt. We'd, we'd compete and then we'd, we'd also... And uh, so, and your own personal journey in terms of where did you start? Uh, how long have you been with Grandmaster Dart? Yeah, I started with the Otakwan in in uh, in the in the late 80s. Um, I ended up joining the um, Grandmaster with Ilshim in in the uh, early 90s. I think it was 1990 um, as a as a, a black tip and. Um, been training 36 years and most of my life has, has been a um, competitor and also an umpire at the same time. Um, and so I'd, you're going to have a big role in uh, One Legacy in the future in terms of umpiring. Um, just wondering if you can share uh, what your vision uh, for, for umpiring is in for, for One Legacy. I think the key, the key thing in any sort of development is to go back to the beginning go back to the legacy of what General Choi has left us, um, go back and look at what the, what the rules were, where we were back then, what we do now. I know we, we all speak so much about how we used to compete and how hard it was and, and all the things that happened back in the 90s. And, you know, have we gone off that path? Um, are we using technology at its best? Um, you know, restarting again, you know, one legacy means to create a legacy, not just to follow. So that legacy that's been left for us, um, there's, there's a chance for us to make real change for the competitors, for the umpires. Um, umpiring is a very hard task, and if we make it so complicated, no one wants to do it, we don't end up with umpires. So making it, making it simple, making it um, accurate, making it recordable, starting again, bringing back the legacy. And I know we've got some um, <laughs> work to do in terms of articulating what, the, uh, what we see as those rules and, and, and how they'll come to life. What's your view in terms of how we do that? I think like, like one legacy, we need to use the legacy of people that have been there. We've got so many good umpires around the world. Um, we've got so many good umpires within our country. Banding everybody together and using um, not, not only the umpire's voice, using the competitor's voice, using the coach's voice, um, the legacy comes from everybody and everybody sees uh, a legacy in a different way. So targeting, you know, targeting the rules based on, you know, being current, um, being easy to access, being understandable. Um, 
You see so many times with power breaking that it just gets left behind. Nobody understands why they got failed, why they got, you know, they didn't succeed a break. It's because it's so complicated. It's about breaking a board. We make it too complicated and no one understands the system. So really getting down to what everybody wants in the legacy, not just one group. There's umpires in a group, there's coaches in a group, there's competitors in a group. Everybody needs to be accountable for what they want in the rules, not just one group. That's really exciting. So in terms of other aspects of umpiring, what's probably the most exciting part for you uh, as we uh, embark on this journey? The excitement is about getting back to competition, you know, getting, getting us all back to where we were um, in the 90s, getting back to the legacy, getting back to local competitions with the children, getting back to regional competitions, getting back to state competitions in each of the countries, banding those competitors together to compete internationally in, in our Asian region. Um, so, so many times we see competitions in Europe. Um, we've, spoken, we've spoken about the size of Asia. We started in Asia, we we're doing a Korean sport. And where do we see our competitions are in Europe. So, you know, I get excited to see what we can bring from um, the Oceanic region and from the, from the Asian region. Um, you know, there's, there's so many practitioners out there. Many of our friends, I've done umpiring, umpiring courses in China. Um, got, we've got some really great umpires all around this region and it excites me to, to get everybody together. Excellent. Thank you, Mr McIntyre. I think um, there's going to be a real differentiator in terms of how we engage uh, and really excited to see what you and the umpiring team do. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Shannon Purser um, to the hot seat. <laughs> welcome. Thanks, Carl welcome. Um, in terms of uh, when you first met Grandmaster Da, um, what struck you in terms of his commitment to the legacy of, 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 of General Choi? Yeah, well, I, uh, going way back before that, I actually started my journey in retake one day. Um, done that for quite a few years and then uh, moved away from the martial arts and, and concentrated on rugby league. And then back in, um, I started my ITF Take One Day journey and met Grandmaster Daha in 2004. And straight away, I could see that his passion and dedication was in, in that legacy of General Choi. So, um, yes, I learned that very quickly in the early days. Um, yeah, we, we, in the recent years, we've become really good friends and um, we share that same passion today in preserving that legacy. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, your perspective on the uh, current focus of, uh, of the ITF? Yeah, I think I, um, I feel the same way like a lot of people have spoken today, that they've, um, personally for me, I think it's more about them lining the pockets of um, individuals and not um, concentrating on their members. Um, as uh, the interview of Mr Abdullah, um, I'm president of um, Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Taekwondo Incorporation, where it's about supporting their members and, um, and not leaving anyone on the sidelines just because they can't afford it. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of grandmasters, masters and instructors around the world that feel the same way as Grandmaster Dara. So I think, you know, once we've started the ball rolling and they get on board and their expertise, and I think the sky's the limit for a legacy take one day, one legacy. So, yep. Fantastic. Um, how did you feel when Grandmaster Dyer asked you to oversee the refinement of the competition rules? I know your, your passion, you know, if, if there's one thing that I, I, I know and have taken from you is your passion for competition and the way that you uh, engage your students and you've got, you know, your, your students are amazing competitors. Um, how did you feel? Yeah, I was actually, I was quite humble actually when he asked me and honoured. Um, my passion is tournaments and, and, and coaching um, and uh, it's something that I, I, I love doing and uh, from my read days I never had that. Um, so I actually ended competitions very late in my years, um, still competed up until three years ago 
um, trying to uh, handle the young ones and whatnot. But uh, I promised my wife that I would retire. <laughs> but uh, I love the coaching and I love the tournaments and, and being involved in, in the operations of them and whatnot. So when GM asked me to, um, to refine the, the tournament, I was yeah, excited about that because I think that's a path that we have to adjust. Uh, we have a clear vision in what we want to achieve and, um, like I said, get back to to making it easier for not only the umpires and the and the and the um, competitors, but also make it more you know a, a spectacle for the for the spectators. You know, bring that bring that back in. Um, in Queensland last year, we were doing uh, a fair bit of that, and um, the crowd really got involved, and you could feel that atmosphere coming back. And I think you know a lot of the, the technique from days gone by um, has gone out the window there. So um, I think. Back to competitions, not only in the sparring, but also in adjusting for patterns and special technique and power breaking. I, uh, I love power breaking. Um, so, it, it, like Mr. McIntyre said, it always got left behind. So, I, I always bring that to the fore now. And uh, yeah, so and I'm really excited about our first One Legacy International competition and implementing some of these rules. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited about the first international competition. Um, obviously, there'll be details around when that will happen yep. uh, coming out uh, over the next coming months. Um, but uh, thank you for all your dedication and hard work in terms of the competition space and really looking forward to getting uh, your competition rules out more broadly so people can really see and get the detail around what, what, what One Legacy will stand for. Yeah, I'm excited. Thanks, Mount Starper. Great. Thanks, Mr Purser.
I just want to canvas the room. How many people are looking at that and going, I want to be on the floor? I was looking at that and going, man, where's my dough box? I really want to be doing that. Uh, I'm really lucky to get some time with Steve Sarkis. I don't know, you know, many of us have known Steve for a long time, uh, but I don't know about you. I've always struggled to get many words out of Steve. And so now I've cornered him and I've got him for the next 10 minutes. At three minutes. <laughs> we'll see. And I've got some pre-prepared questions here too. So this is going to be fun for me and really hard for Steve. Uh, well, it's actually going to be harder for me to try and get two word answers out of him, but we'll see how we go. Mark, you've got to remember the ones that don't speak are the ones that are most... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, they're the ones you've got to watch out for, the quiet ones. This is definitely Steve. Um, but I want to start by asking you, how did you become t involved in Taekwondo? Um, we met Grandmaster Daha probably 15 years ago. Uh, my kids were quite young my three boys, and I wanted to put them into a Taekwondo school um, to teach them a bit of self-defence. And I remember I, um, my star was training at a, just an old school hall, not far from where we lived. And I walked in to see him. And um, I got two words out of him when I asked him the first question. And then I walked back out, and I walked back in again. I had another question for him, and he was training some kids. Uh, can I see you again? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I asked him another question. And he got a bit cranky because I was interrupting his class. So... That's how we met. Oh, that's hilarious. What was that first question? Do you remember? Uh, how much were the training fees? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, one of your boys has actually been on the floor before, eh? Um, the little unit. Come on, come on up and, uh, and show us. Cause, Chris, <laughs> Chris I, I'm a bit like... <laughs> it's been a few years since I've seen Chris. And last time I saw Chris, I think he was about... Uh, it's, turn around for us. I think he was about this tall and he was skinnier than me. And I see him today, I'm like, my God, where did those jeans come from? Can you, can you stand uh, next to your dad for come, a bit? Definitely come from me. <laughs> Far out, look at this guy, it's awesome. Yeah. So really great to see you, thanks very much for coming up. So, you got involved in Taekwondo through the kids? Yeah, it's my three kids um, trained Grandmaster Hart since the age of six. Uh, they currently, three of them still do train, whilst they're not working. Um, yeah, um, my Grandma Star has been more of a father figure to my children. Um, I think I tell him a lot more than what they tell me, which I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, um, yeah, the kids have been around him for a long time. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your professional career, your background? How did you end up being you? Um, I've been involved in a couple of decent sized businesses. My previous business was uh, Bingo Industries in Sydney. I started that in 1997. We IPO'd and public listed in 2014. Had a bit of a spell and just did whatever's in between. Um, then I bought a business in the Gold Coast called Lloyd's Auctioneers and Valuers. Uh, we had three locations in 2019. Um, and currently have 13 locations around Australia. And we employ about 400 people nationally. Um, yeah, I just, we just go and have heaps of fun, so. Well, that's, um, you know, I've, I've had, a, and Paul mentioned before the, the podcast or the YouTube channel that I'm running at the moment where I'm ha having conversations with people. And I'm often in this position where I think, where did I go wrong in my career <laughs> when I get the opportunity to talk to guys like you that have just had this such amazing experiences and, and ended up in an incredible place? What is the like, company that you listed? What, what was that, the name of that company? Uh, the first company was Bingo Industries. Um, it's a recycling skipping business that uh, we started in 97, a couple of trucks and probably 100 bins. We IPO'd for one, uh, 1. 1.4 billion um, in 2014. 
wasn't all my money. But no, no, no. <laughs> I, I just, it was I, a team effort with some family. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I'm you know from New Zealand. The the just for your background here, the Australian share market I think is about a thousand times the New Zealand share market, or it was when I was in Australia studying the markets. Uh, and you know, my my own boss, uh, our company recently sold to Daiichi for just under a billion New Zealand, and we're like, yeah, that, that was a, a significant uh, sale in the New Zealand market. And here in Australia, it's just chicken feed, right? It's just it's not uncommon to have billion dollar companies. No, it's not. Um, so Lloyd's Auctions and Values are 13 locations around Australia. We've just launched around the world. Just launched in the UK, US, Europe, and India. An online presence. So um, in Australia, we pitched to 24, 25 million people. Um, in those four countries, we've pitched to 4 billion people uh, for online sales. So our business is um, repossessions, banking, insolvency, and we also sell for consumers and, and mums and dads. Right. And, and um, what, you know, in terms of running a business, there are a huge range of skills that are really important in that kind of executive team. Uh, as the person leading the business, what is your um, core skill set that you've come up with? through business in? Is it the, the entrepreneurial leadership? Is it the HR management? What, what, what do you say your skill set so is? So I think um, most successful business, people always want to be the biggest. Um, I've never wanted to be the biggest. Uh, for us, it's all about people and culture. If you get your people and culture correct, money always flows. It's the opportunity of money always comes. So um, for me, it's just about our people and make sure they're comfortable what they're doing. That's a, a, a fascinating insight by my own uh, boss who recently retired, actually, uh, Naomi Ballantyne. She is the same. Uh, her major skill set is putting strong people around her and, and building a good culture. So to, to hear that that's your uh, passion as well, it, it's no surprise that you've ended up where you are. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. Now, a man of your skills and your experience and your, you know, what you, you have become in business, you would be a, an incredible asset to any company, uh, any sports organisation, any charity. Why Taekwondo? Look, for me, it's an opportunity to give back to the community. Um, you know, I see on the TV in Australia, there's a lot of um, uh, crime and violence, uh, uh, especially in Queensland and, and Victoria. I think New South Wales have got under control. I just see our kids um, learning the tenets of Taekwondo and, and, and the discipline and... You know, we can go to sleep knowing our kids can go out and defuse situation or, or do what yeah. they have to do to protect themselves. Um, I just think it's a way for me to give back um, and be involved with a great leader like Grandmaster Dave. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, how will you be involved in One Legacy? Look, I've been asked to be the Vice President. Thank you, Grandmaster. <laughs> um, but I'm also on the advisory board for the business perspective. You know, I want to help Grandmaster Dave uh, put all the systems in play. Uh, not the day-in-day -day stuff, but just the business aspect, yeah. um, the transparency, we want people to trust us. Um, we want to give back, we want people to be heard. Um, you know, previous organisations, people that are not heard. Our, 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 our business one legacy, people will be heard and um, yeah. So it's, it's culture again. Absolutely. Uh, now given your, you know, your experience having built up a billion dollar company, as you've just told me, uh, what is your vision for One Legacy Taekwondo, uh, International Taekwondo Federation for say for 10 years time, 20 years time? Where do you see One Legacy? Well, our vision is probably um, to get as many countries as we can to come across and join our organisation um, and give back to them. So whether you're a grandmaster or a master or a student, um, it's the same philosophy for us. Just let them be heard, and let's see how we can help them. So look after the members. Absolutely. Now, in my you know, experience, having been on the New Zealand board, the international board, uh, you need resources to run an organisation, right? Uh, and, and the budgets that we've had in some of these organisations are very tiny. Uh, the more um, budget that the organisation has, the more it can produce resources for its members, the more it can look after its members. Uh, have you got any thoughts for how an organisation like One Legacy can develop a, a budget that isn't chicken feed? Oh, mate, it's just it's all about our systems and um, who we bring on board and how many members we bring on board. We'll look at um, revenue streams that we can obviously uh, put back into the, the bank. But um, it's early days for us. I think we'll just stay humble for a minute and just put the word out and just see what we can bring across to join our, our team. Right, yeah. So put the vision out there. Put the uh, the, the the idea of why the organisation exists, what's, what its values are, Absolutely. the fact that it's there for its members, uh, and and yeah, just build on what comes out. Absolutely. Great, Steve. It's, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to have a proper chat with you. You know, just you and me and a, and a few mates in the room and a couple of hundred thousand on the internet. That's okay.
Uh, but yeah, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Good on you. Thanks, Mark. I am very, I get all the, the, the hot gigs. I now get to interview the great Grandmaster Daha, which is really exciting. As I said, I first met Grandmaster Daha, I think it might have been around, I started in 1989, I was a blue stripe, must have been about 1991. Uh, but he won't remember that because I was just this, you know, um, green stripe. Uh, blue stripe that came over from New Zealand and it wasn't I think until I moved over here around 2000 uh, that you know we, we he really got to um, to know me and uh, try and keep me in line uh, I know that there are lots of people on the ITF that have tried to keep Grandmaster Daha in line and failed uh, he has similar challenges trying to keep me in line so thank you very much for your support and for your your time today Grandmaster Daha pleasure thank you very much Mark now, my first question for you, as after 55 years devoted to international taekwondo, to the legacy of General Che, to, to General Che himself when he was alive, why did you resign from the ITF? Okay, yeah, you, ha you asked the harder question and I'm always answering the question. Uh, a little bit of my background, I'm, uh, we are 10 in the family, six of brothers and four sisters. I am the young one in the family. I've always been now the black dog in the family and also on ITF as well. A lot of people always, they hate to listen to me what I say because I always say the truth. I wouldn't worry how the people feel about it. To me, it doesn't bother me in life. If you want to say something, you say it. If the people, they're not comfortable about it, they're the one they have to deal with it and they're the one they just basically uh, have to just face the truth. Yes, I've been doing our service general show for many, many years. I made general show when I was 15 years old, 16 years old. I served the ITF for 55 years of my life. After General Shoy have passed away, I just basically, we form an organization. And I have served that organization for 20 years. Four years out of that 20 years, I was the vice president. Also, I was a member of the Grandmaster Promotion Committee. I was a board member. Also, I was a member of the Asian Development Team. Probably I'm the only one, or maybe there's a few have held that many positions. Lately, I have found out the ITF, or whatever ITF you can call it at the time, we have missing the point where we serve our members, democracy, in, you know, the, democracy and also transparency. Me, personally, I didn't see that's happening. And I could not stay there and compromise my integrity in being a witness of decision. I don't believe in it. And that is the reason why I'm always looking how we can serve our members when a man have basically faces integrity anyway in life if you really want to compromise your integrity you haven't got nothing left in life to live for and that's something i believe very strongly so how will one legacy international taekwondo federation be different what what is it going to offer to its members that's that's going to be different well first thing i don't think anybody have thought we will go to that direction and we form international organization there's nobody have ever thought about it or even they dream that could possible. We have done the impossible, okay? The reason why we have done the impossible because I believe in serving the people. I believe in serving the martial art community. As I mentioned before, Taekwondo have saved my life, okay? One of the most important things in Taekwondo, when you reach the rank of Grand Masters, you have got 55 years of your life. And that 55 years should be count for something. The Grand Master's voice must be heard. The Grand Master's opinion and knowledge must be shared. Otherwise, how is it possible we will continue promoting the legacy of General Shaw in educating that, young, that younger generation? It's otherwise, it's impossible. It's uh, not only the young, not only uh, basically when you talk about one legacy, a lot of people misunderstood what is one legacy mean, one legacy and the Federation. We're talking about General Shaw legacy, okay? John Shaw, you find a lot of people these days that don't even know who John Shaw is. If you go to World Championship, I, will, I can guarantee you 75% probably the people, they see a big picture of John Shaw on the wall. Yes, you can display that, that picture anyway. But the meaning behind that picture, the meaning behind that man, they are the philosophy we should be promoting, not the picture. But what behind that picture? What that picture represents? And who is that man? If anybody knows General Shaw has been in the prison war, no. 
If anybody now, Joshua was going to be hanged seven years, seven days later before the war is finished? No. See, this man has sacrificed his whole entire life for us, to give us direction, to give us life. Okay? How many people know about that? Not many people. Okay, the people they run after the, the belt, when come to the grade in the certificate. Yes, I am a non-degree black belt. How many certificates I got on my wall, in my gym, or in my house? Not even one. Just a paper to me. Mean nothing. The rank mean nothing if you don't practice it, and if you don't follow it. Just only rank. You can buy it easy, very easy to buy it. Okay, and I think I believe a lot of, a lot of area in life in Taekwondo, especially in ITF Taekwondo, need to be reviewed. The philosophy of General Shoy, the rule of General Shoy, the technique of General Shoy, and his vision. That's one of the most important things. I, I certainly, um, you know, I know from having known you for many years now, just how much uh, you live these values and the, you know, the, the amount of people that have come forward, uh, even for the event today, that you've helped in the past, and, and it's going to come back with people thanking you uh, from all the work that you've done for them. So, you know, it's, it's great to have somebody at the head of the organisation that does does live those values and represent that legacy of General Trey. You mentioned there the, the Grand Masters uh, and and how they should be involved and treated. And, and, you know, there's a risk now with a lot of Grand Masters in the ITF that they're going to get pushed to one side and, and put out to pasture. How will one legacy be different? How will it take, um, ensure that Grand Masters have the, uh, the well, in English, we'd, uh, sorry, in Māori in New Zealand, we'd say the mana, the, the reputation, the, the involvement that they deserve from all those years of dedication and the skills that they have to share. How will you ensure in one legacy that their role, they, they get that valued part? As I mentioned before, this, uh, everything you've got to do in life has to be based on some knowledge. It has to be based on some understanding. Okay? The Grand Masters is one of the who they have served in the ITF community for so many years. We'll be creating as a committee, as can, as actually, one legacy should be run and should be a protect, it should be looking after from one legacy. One legacy is the Grand Masters. Without the Grand Masters, we don't have one legacy, okay? At the present time, in the one legacy under the Taekwondo Federation, you have one Grand Masters, which is me. I understand that. But I can guarantee you there's a lot of people, when they realize what the Grand Masters meant, I can guarantee you that will come across because they need to be recognized, and they should be recognized. And that is a crime if we don't recognize them after so many years. Yes, we have lost a few grandmasters here and there. Whatever the reason is, some other grandmaster move on the side, they didn't say anything or do anything. I refuse. I'm born free, I live free, I die free. No one control me. Thank you, sir. Now, today is day one of One Legacy, International Taekwondo Federation. Where will it be in three years, in five years, in ten years? What's your vision for One Legacy? I'm a very confident I'll never step back from any mission. I have never lost a fight in my life. I can promise the people who are here and the people who they are really love the John Shoy legacy, that legacy in five years' time to ten years' time will be the major force in the ITF community. That's great to hear. Thank you, sir. Uh, every organisation needs a good good leader. Uh, can you tell me what, what is involved in good leadership? What does it mean to be a good leader? I don't like you, Mark. Uh, <coughs> You've said that to me many times, sir, and I, I know don't. it's not I true because you keep inviting okay. me over. You, your leadership, you're not really born. You're not really uh, learn to be leader. You're done. You're actually born to be leader. But you have to activate the leader side of you. Okay? You don't have to pretend to be someone else. Just be yourself. The people will accept you, respect you the way you are. But when you try to be someone else, and you try to be are your leader, but you're not a leader, one way or the other, the true person will come to the surface, and then you lose the respect of the community, you lose the respect of the people, because you are trying to be something, but you're not. Leadership always it must be yourself. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are. It's just the way is you are, the people expect you respect you the way you are. So authenticity 
being true to yourself is, is a very important part of leadership for you. And many times I said a lot of things to different people that didn't like it. And I said, unfortunately, that is a reality. We don't every, basically like everything people tell us. But if you really want to be honest to yourself, and you want to be honest to the person you're talking to all the time, just tell them exactly what the situation is all about, who you are. Like yourself, you annoy me on many occasions. <laughs> and I'm, I'll, I'll be saying it truly. I know you are, sir. But I always believe you always get, you know, it's a good attention. How many times I have a fight with you on the board? Uh, many times, sir. Many there, times. Yes. And every time you know I'm reaching my level to be angry just to pull away. But I still respect your knowledge, respect you being very intelligent, especially when it comes to governing. You're a lot more smarter than me covering the organization. And that's really bothered me. But I have to accept it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, there's a lot to live up to here, sir. So I'll, I'll do my best and I'll try my best not to be annoying going forward, unless it's appropriate. In which case, I reserve the right to continue being annoying. Um, sir, thank you very much for your time. I, we are now, I think, going to get a group of us out and have a bit of a chat together. So uh, can we just please thank Grandmaster Daha for everything he's done? And we'll, uh, we'll get the chairs out for the team. Just one thing I want to mention before when I was thanking all the people, they, they helped me, all that, all that really basically had put a lot of time and effort. There's one person I did not mention before, and actually we here today, especially after the World Cup, the result of one person, his name is Steve Sarkis there, and he hates me always being mentioned, his, how, much, how much effort and how much time he put behind the scene, not many people know. I just want to tell you the smallest story about Steve Sarkis. I think back in the 90s or something like that. Anyway, it's, um, he walked into my gym one day. I didn't even know anything about Steve Sarkis. And he saw me. I was very angry, unhappy. At that time, we was approaching to go to the World Championship. There was a couple of boys or a couple of guys in, in the team. They haven't got enough money to pay for the airfare. And that's what I was angry about because I couldn't help him. I said, what's wrong with you? I said, nothing. I said, come on, tell me what is happening. But I'll tell him what happened. I'll point my fingers to those people. He didn't say a word, he just went. I believe that was two weeks before Christmas. I was working, he rang me. If he had sent me a bank account, I said, what for? He said, I want to pay for my kid. I used to have a three boy training with me. I want to pay for my kid for next year. I couldn't bother remember every month. I said, oh, thank you, no problem. I sent him my bank account, probably forgot about it. And he rang me one week later, he said, Merry Christmas. I said, for what? I said, I put. $25,000 a bank account to help that young kid. And he doesn't want to know, anybody can know about it, but I just want to tell you what that man have done behind the scene. And if it wasn't him, the World Cup will not be successful. Steve, on behalf of myself and the One Legacy and the International Taekwondo Federation, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, David. Thank you, Steve. On that On note, that can we note, please we ask uh, Steve Sarkis to come up, Master Paul Harper, and I think Trevor McIntyre. Mr. McIntyre, please come on up. Okay, let's have a chat. Oh, I'm, I'm going to start some, uh, kick off with some questions here. Uh, for those of us that have been doing Taekwondo for a while, uh, can you share a memory about your time with General Che? Straight to the junior. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the 90s, uh, Grandmaster was promoted back in the day to, I think it might have been fifth degree. Um, broke his hand. Um, throughout the day we were doing, uh, which is the important thing for me as a memory, we were, we were training for months and months with the seminar. All of the students were, you know, 
back to the book, page by page, making sure that everybody, if you got asked to, you know, to do a pattern, put your hand up, you know, put your hand up, get up and demonstrate, you know, so we were, we were so dedicated on doing these patterns and the biggest memory of that moment is to, you know, throughout the day, so many of um, Grandmaster's students would, you know, put their hand up and get up and do a pattern that people just wouldn't put their hands up anymore. They were like, we would just get picked so much, you know, and they'd be picked on. And, you know, General Chaw was a very tough, you know, he didn't like it. And if you were overweight, he would tell you that you're overweight and you shouldn't be an instructor. And he was just, you know, so brutal. But he was so brutally honest. And I, you know, Grandmaster Deha has a lot of that um, in himself because that's, that's how the instructors were back in those days, you know. And, and you know, I remember putting my hand up and I must have demonstrated four or five patterns that day. And he just just waved to say, not you. I've seen, you know, not you, not you. And then someone had demonstrated a pattern. He'd say, who is your instructor? And he'd say, he'd say, oh, Michael Deha. And they'd say, sit down, somebody else, you know. And they just <laughs> just remember that. And it's, where, where, is, you know, where is your instructor, you know. And so they're, they're good fond memories to know that right back then we were being taught the legacy, you know, in the 90s. Not waiting till now to teach it. Yeah. We've been teaching that since the 90s. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Trevor. Can you pass it over to Master Harper? What's your uh, favourite memory there? I'm going to be honest. I never met General Choi. Wow. So that's the black mark on my history in terms Give of... Give me your favourite memory legacy. from the old days of training in Taekwondo. Um, I remember the first time I met Grandmaster Daya in, in Ballarat. Um, we're in this big hall where everyone's running around and someone did something wrong. And there would have been about, oh, probably about 40 to 50 students running around and then something, someone did something wrong and they found out about it. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone stopped. Everyone's gone, oh, I'm glad I'm not that person. Um, and uh, and that, was my, that was one of the uh, memories I have of Grandmaster Dayo back then. But... Um, uh, as uh, Mr. McIntyre said, uh, you know, certainly the feedback in terms of, uh, you know, it's always given in, in, it might be harsh, it might be a bit cutting, but it was always to, to improve you. It wasn't done in a, it always came from a good place. Yes. Yep. Grandmaster Daha, your favourite memory with the general? Sorry? Your favourite memory with the general? Uh, well, he was in Australia, he was in Eastwood, and... And then he wanted to have a soup. But he wanted to have a, it's a Korean soup. We walk into the restaurant where it's run by World Taekwondo Federation. <laughs> oh, I mean, oh, maybe people from South Korea. And then the waiter's coming in and he said to him, John Short said to him, you're not Taekwondo? He said, uh, yeah. He said, what Taekwondo? He said, uh, World Taekwondo. He said, that's the beach of the beach. I said, General, we're in South Korean area. We have to be a little bit more careful, you know? And it took me a little bit more time to settle him down. Even this case where I have to make a phone call to get some people outside to make sure if something did happen, I can protect the General because I was on my own. Then when we walk outside, I said, I said, General, did you know those people, you know, is a North Korean restaurant, South Korean? He said, yes, I know that. But I want them to know they cannot steal the name of Taekwondo. <laughs> Taekwondo has belonged to me. I create Taekwondo. And that was uh, not only fun memory, it was a scary one, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, I bet. It was a scary one. Yeah, I, I, um, I went to, I was lucky enough to have a number of seminars with the general. And when he passed away, it was around the time I was co-editing the New Zealand magazine. We used to put a magazine out three times a year for our members. And my friend, um, Matthew Breen, and I, we were editing at the time. We wrote an article about our, our time with General Chain. We wrote this article and we put in a whole lot of favourite sayings. If you remember the, the seminars of the general, he'd have the same things that would come up again and again. And I think one of my favourite ones was so funny. He would go, power. No power. See? No, it looked the same. And all the time I trained with him, I'd never figured out the difference between A and B, the power, no power thing. I could never figure it out. But he was such a scientific teacher. He was such an incredible teacher, the way that he taught. He was... Um, Mr. McIntyre, really intolerant of, you know, it's very direct, really intolerant of, of incompetence. Who your instructor? You got your instructor, ask for your money back. 
You know, he had some real scathing stuff to say. But if he liked you, you know, if, if he was impressed, he'd say, oh, who are you instructor? Ah, Paul McPhail, very good instructor. So, you know, he just he'd call a spade a spade every time. Real, real dark sense of humour, amazing, amazing man. Yeah, Jenna Shaw was very, um, very direct. He's not a polite. When he wants to say something, he say it straight to the point. And he found a lot of people. Obviously, maybe that's, that's not a... Not that issue I'm facing as well, but there's no apology from my behalf. If I want to say something, I say it the way it is. And that's always been like that. Well, I'm actually going uh, to, to follow on from that a little bit and get you to hand the mic to, uh, to Steve. Steve, can you share your favourite memory with Grandmaster Daha? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> where do I start? Uh, no, well, I've, I've been lucky enough to travel around the world of Grandmaster Daha and we'll be walking through some of the tournaments He'd be just beside me or in front of me, and people would stop and bow at me. I'm going, what's that fucking bowing at? Like, what's that bowing at? So, he goes, oh, we look the same. <laughs> so, I was always mistaken for him. Well, I, I did actually, the first time I met you, I can't, it was in one of the international competitions. Yeah. Who's this guy? Is that Grandma Sister? Has, no, it's, it's not his son. Yeah. Who was this guy? Yeah. yeah always yeah. mistaken. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's, there's one thing about between me, yes. Um, He's not really, that's reality, he can confirm that. Sometimes we're going somewhere, we're going to meet somewhere. We end up in the place, we're wearing the same shirt, same colour shirt, <laughs> yep. same jean. One particular one time went to see a boxing match and said, did you ring my wife and ask her what I'm wearing? <laughs> I said, honestly not. We actually, if you see that picture, you cannot tell. We have exactly... <laughs> <laughs> Is that why you grew the beard, Steve? <laughs> you grew the beard to, to, yeah. to get some differentiation? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask you another Taekwondo question. A quick fire. Favourite technique? Uh, I like all the tricky middle knuckle oh. punches for breaks and all the, obviously, my... The nut bar stuff. Yeah, because that's what we had to do anyway, so if you're going to do it, you may as well train it. Yeah, nice. Nice. Master Harper, favourite technique? Uh, for me, it'd have to be back kick. Oh. <laughs> the amount of power you just can crank into uh, some... Poor student holding the pad for you. Um, just uh, <laughs> love being able to wind up. GMD? Oh, it's just, you can look at the pastors, my jumping, twisting kick, and also I love my back when I see it. Mustafa, I take a lot of luxury <laughs> out of that, which is right there on the bottom. Yeah, nice. Awesome. I think for me it's got to be Yopchagi. I'm very much with uh, Grandma Salana. Don't know what to do, Yopchagi. How about favourite pattern? Quenge. Why Quenge? Yeah, I just like the, the pace. Gives you the time to slow yeah. down and take a breath, Mr. Yeah. McIntyre. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the time you get there, you're already tired. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, uh, uh, for me, Hawa Rang. Um, when oh, yeah. I first learned that, I thought that was the, and I still do, it's my absolute favourite pattern. Most beautiful and just comes together really well. First ITF pattern written, Hawa Rang. Oh. Yeah. Uh, video game. Yeah, yes, <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Chunji. Chunji? It's the easy one. <laughs> the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All the pattern is my favourite. Have, you have to, you really cannot, yeah, some people that can favour one than the other, but as, as the Grand Masters or Masters, they should be all equal. I, I think you're absolutely right that it's about, you know, it's like having kids, right? You don't have a favourite child. You don't, you tell everyone else you don't have, but you really do have a favourite child. Come on. Um, my pattern's got to be Yushin. Yushin is just such a powerhouse pattern. It's such a great pattern to feel. Uh, I also think Moon Moo is a pattern that has a wonderful flow and a wonderful feeling to it. Even though it's really hard and I probably look awful doing it, it just feels great. It flows beautifully. Um, what about Steve Sarkis? What's his favourite pattern? <laughs> I wasn't going to ask Steve for, <laughs> for key reasons. Uh, I could ask him what his, who his favourite son is, but that might get him in a bit of trouble. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, okay, uh, what about a question then about the uh, Leg One Legacy International Taekwondo Federation? What, uh, what are you looking forward to the most? In fact, um, let's start with Steve on this one. What are you looking forward to the most about being part of One Legacy? Oh, I think it's just a, um, it's, it's a new start for, for our people. So um, I'm looking to see how, how it grows and where we end up. As I said, I want to be the biggest, I want to be the best and what we do. Yeah, fantastic. I'm, look, I'm looking forward to the journey. Cool. GMD, what are you looking forward to the most about One Legacy? 
Just keep the, keep the people, democracy, transparency, and the good technique. That's what it's all about. Absolutely, it's got to be true to Taekwondo. I think for me is, is to change the experience that a lot of our students and members have and really ramp it up, you know, have some online uh, content that they can consume in their own time, at home, in their bedrooms. Um, we haven't seen a lot of it. and we, we, How do we use that technology just to have our members and students just have a different experience, an enhanced experience that uh, we haven't really seen? That's absolutely spoken to someone who is uh, an IT professional, not a chartered accountant. Well done. <laughs> um, I think um, Steve actually mentioned something earlier in his conversation and it's about culture it's about bringing the people to the culture and ego is not culture you know it's when you bring people in with the right culture people work together you don't have to ask it just happens because of culture and that's not culture in nationality it's culture in creating something that's that's for everybody and you want to be a part of something that's for everybody. You don't want to be part of something that's just for an, an elite few. So it's, it's look, I'm really looking forward to creating a culture. Yeah, and, and Taekwondo should have a very strong culture, right? And, and you know, you've, we've seen here today the strong culture that Grandmaster Daha has created around uh, Taekwondo here. And it's inherent in who we are, but we, as you said before, Grandmaster Daha, it feels like in many places we've lost that. You know, people that look up at the photo of the general and don't really know what that means. The Josie, you're right, Trevor. Uh, for me, I think there's two things I'm looking forward to. One is around uh, the structure of the organisation, getting the organisation structure right to start with. Because when, when, we're doing done good, right? You get the foundation right and everything else flows from that and, and it'll become a whole lot easier. So I really want to make sure that we get that foundation right. Uh, but the other part of it comes back to the art. And I love the way that you're, you know, as we saw with the demos today, uh, pulling back to, you know, Taekwondo is not about turning kicks and punches. There's a whole lot more to it than that, right? It ultimately is a martial art of self-defense. And that's always been my passion in Taekwondo is the self-defense aspect. And you don't get good self-defense by throwing side kicks and turning kicks. You've got to do everything. It's got to be holistic. The, the elbows, the knees, the, um, you know, ripping of people's off, you know, ears off and waving and that sort of stuff is really important to me. It's a, it's a big part of who we are. Um, I'm going to open, what sort of questions, Master Harper, you've got the mic. Fire away a question. I'm going to relinquish the talking stick. Um, oh, a question for GMD. What do you think is going to be our biggest challenge? <clears throat> well, just really basically in life you don't have to challenge anyone you only have to challenge yourself and set up the goal for yourself and you go for it don't waste too much time on negativity people people they're going to try to bring you down no matter what you do if you focus on being very positive and that's what you'll be successful you know that's why i said in the beginning i mean I don't, I don't really have that much a problem what people say what really important to me what i believe in about myself what my what, what my what my vision Anybody with art vision, basically you've got nothing. Is vision one of the most important things, whether martial art, life, relationship, you name it. Vision is everything in life. Soon you lose your vision, you've got no direction in life. I, um, Steve's just had a really uh, very smart thought, which is you know, why he's here, because he's got all the smart thoughts. Uh, f questions from the floor. We've got some amazing people in the room here. What do you want to know? Raise your hand and, and we'll come around with a mic. Thanks, Mr. McIntyre. We'll go with the question from Liang from Adelaide. Yeah, mate, far away, mate. Online world champion, by the way. Just humble brag oh, for him. Oh, nice. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, I am impressed by... Grandmaster, and especially the more time and more training I spent with him, the more I found out about Taekwondo. So he flipped over my hobby from hobby become a passion and something for the character and the personal growth. Um, sir, have you ever, um, how to put my words together? Um, how can why a martial art can become something so important for the humanity, for example, like the world peace. But I can, for that, I can understand myself. But um, how can, 
Why Taekwondo is so impactful? For example, I'm from Malaysia. When I know no one in Australia, I find isolated. Because of Taekwondo, I find I become immediately included in Australia. Not only that, after I train in view, I find I also included in the whole world. So how do you do that? And I believe this culture you, you actually bring to the One Legacy. Thank you. If I mention something to you, Leanne, I'm, uh, education is not the education you learn in the school. When you educate something, when you get education in the school, say for example, pilot, he will never become as a lawyer. Or lawyer cannot be, become a pilot because each of those people, they have used their education in one channel in life. But when you talk about martial art education, martial art education is the open, widest education. Okay, not about reading a book. It's about personal education. If you haven't got your own personal education in life, you haven't got a vision. You haven't got a respect to yourself. You need to know yourself before you can know anyone else. Okay? Martial art gives you that power to read yourself. Martial art gives you the integrity so you can recognize other people's right as well. Now, my biggest mistake in my life, in my early days, probably Joe Campus and Joe Sairoti in the back, can rely that I've never been wrong, even Trevor, I've never been wrong. I've always been right. And that was my, my, my biggest mistake in life. Because I never used to listen to nobody. That's not a biggest mistake. Till I start to look to myself first. When someone says something to you and you don't like it, don't respond. First thing, ask that question. Why that person have said that to me? What I have done for him to react that way? The mistake not always start with the other. The mistake always start with yourself. Okay? Taekwondo give you that, that journey, give you that education, that give you that wider thinking in your mind to try to recognize the conversation from so many different angles. More questions around the room? See a hand? Don't be shy. Oh, here we go. No, uh, no. No, John. Oh, uh, John. Why the name One Legacy? I already know the answer, but for everyone here, why the name One Legacy? Well, we, uh, it's basically we're coming back to the history uh, of the Taekwondo. The history of Taekwondo is being created by General Choi Hong Hee. On the 11th of, our, of April 1955, uh, Taekwondo's birthday, when they call it Taekwondo. And General Choi Legacy is, uh, is a history from physical training it's, it's a mental discipline, uh, etiquette, respect, integrity, you name it, all combined in one, one person have basically a push very much on the tenet of Taekwondo. Okay? And that, because of his life, what he ever created, has to become, one le become a legacy. Okay? And that's what we call it, One Legacy International Taekwondo Federation, which we go back to General Shui, to his history, following his footsteps, we doing Taekwondo. Who created Taekwondo? Who better than General Choi? We're going back to that. We're going back to review and elevate that, that legacy, his legacy. He's no longer here to uh, basically uh, promote his legacy. If he's here, we won't call it legacy. Uh, 96. I gave my General Choi my resignation. 96, 1996. He didn't accept my resignation. And when Grandmaster Serif, he was a nine degree black belt, he asked him, he said, General, this young kid, he resigned, he didn't accept his resignation. And you usually expel people from the ITF, masters or grandmasters. He said, yes. But this young kid is an angry man like me. He got a bad temper like me. He reminded me of myself, one day that person will be one of the Taekwondo leader. Here we are today. I'm announcing his legacy. One legacy, International Taekwondo Federation. Obviously, that stuck in my head all those years. It's something when people do the right thing by you, don't forget them the rest of your life. That's a part of you, if you're true to yourself. One thing I know about you, which I'm sure everyone that knows you personally, is your integrity. Um, I've trained with you for about six years one-on-one, -on -one, and it's very torturous, 
what you say is what you said up there is very true you're black and white there's no gray spot there but thank you very much on behalf of everyone i'm sure for having us here and the integrity that you have the passion that you have for taekwondo is just amazing thank you thank you john I have to wait till you clap because you all had your hand up. I was going to pick someone. <laughs> Who's got a question? Question or thought? Yes, we have one. Yes. I wouldn't understand your bands. I need a translation. Translate, yeah, I Cindy. <laughs> translate for uh, me. Uh, so I got, I got a question. Uh, uh, no offense. Uh, all the martial arts, uh, they have the, their good, good stuff and they have their weakness as well. Uh, my question is, any chance of possible you're going to uh, like, uh, observe uh, other martial arts good stuff into the one leg like the right here, uh, uh, Taekwondo? Any chance? Uh, you, you're going to consider or you don't, you don't consider? Where's my translator? Cindy? So Ben was saying that there are a lot of, different, um, a lot of good things in other martial arts. Um, and are you going to be introducing some of them into, into our organisation? So I, I believe the answer's no there. <laughs> uh, all right, this, uh, there's no such a martial art in the world. It's not a good martial art. There's none. All the martial arts, and doesn't matter what you call it, Taekwondo, Karate, Kung Fu, Hapki Do, doesn't matter. They all... They are good martial art. They are good for the community if they serve in the community the right way. It's like a religion. How many people here we have, they are different religion. But you think if we are here, about five different, six people have a different religion. Are we have a six different God? No. We have one God, but we all pray in different ways. And we believe in, it's all... It's, we all pray in different way, but it is one God. Martial art is exactly the same thing. Martial art providing the community in different need, but it's still providing the community with good way of life. You can see, you can talk to some Taekwondo instructor, for example. He says, oh, karate is not good. You know? It's really that person is only talking about himself. He's not talking behind of his art. Because if you're a good martial art person, you will not be saying other martial art no good. That all the martial art is a great, a great philosophy and a great need for the community. Can, can I add to that, sir? That uh, one of the things that I've, I'm sure many of us have found over the years is the way that Taekwondo can be taught by many people isn't all of Taekwondo. And before we even start thinking about what else is missing, look through the book and see that half of it's, or most of it's already there. Taekwondo has all this stuff. We've just got to, you know, make sure that we're teaching all of Taekwondo, not a subset of it. Well, if you can see the boy when there was a practicing a little bit here before we was using, uh, that was using Alban, that was using knee, which is something we, we teach in our class. We're using a lot of kick and target to, to, to practice those technique. And, and basically, when you're talking using your album, using your knee, they are in the pattern. We're not bringing something new to the march to, to Taekwondo. They are in the pattern. If you do the pattern, the pattern, you've got low kick, you've got knee, you've got elbow. Why generally should you put that technique in the pattern if we don't want to practice it? But unfortunately, because of the competition, those technique has been taken away from the Taekwondo. That's the reason why we have to bring that technique back. So we bring the value of the, all the techniques that John Choi have to create. That's one of the reasons why we're using those techniques. I don't believe there's any other technique around the world. I mean, when you look at Taekwondo, it's a massive, massive range of different techniques. But they'll have to be practiced so that can be in reality. If you don't practice it, you'll never know what they are. But when you do the pattern, you're doing, you're doing those techniques. You happy that we um, we've yep. Thank you very much. Soon? Yeah, that's all good. What I need now, I need Mr. McIntyre and Shannon Persa to come forward, please.
Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Steve. Okay, I have those two gentlemen here. They, uh, each one of them have got a, some history with me. I will let uh, Trevor talk a little bit about his history. When he was with me, he decided he wanted to go away, and then he come back. <laughs> Sorry, Trevor. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> G uh, Gr Grand Masters, you know, spoke about his, his early days and... Um, I'm, I'm very much like him, very passionate. We, we decided that um, it was best for us to take our own road for 13 years, wasted, <laughs> until uh, I returned to, to the ITF. And what, I, what I really want to take the point from this is that we went our separate ways um, for 13 years, but, our, but, but the strength of that, um, when I returned, I didn't come back for him. I didn't come back for, for Michael Da. I didn't leave Michael Da. I left Taekwondo. When I come back, I come back for the ITF. I come back for the people. I come back for the community. And it wasn't until we found each other again that our relationship changed. We found that what was missing was the soul. And I think one legacy is gonna have soul. And all the people that are in this room, all the people that are connected to his soul are going to create a huge impact for Taekwondo. Because if you find your soul, you find Taekwondo. Thank you, Trip. Shannon, you've been away from me for so long, but we never met before on one organization. But... You've been circulating around me for so many years, but you never make the effort to come across. Can you tell me why? I think, GM, in the early days, um, my Taekwondo journey has been pretty turmoil, turmoil with um, politics. Um, I chose to move away and just be independent in 2011. Um, a lot of poisonous people, I believe, kept me and you apart. Um, when we finally come back together, I actually realised why, because we're so like-minded um, and they didn't want us together. But um, since 2018 that, we're, um, that we've reconnected and I find that we are so much alike and, um, and uh, that, that's only a positive thing. Uh, you know, I go back, I often think about and I speak to my students that, you know, I wish we had have got together in 2000 and um, earlier in 2000 and ten and whatnot, but uh, unfortunately that didn't happen. But I think it's our time now, and uh, I'd definitely be making the most of it. Okay, thank you, Trevor. You didn't finish your story when you come back, and I asked you what degree you are. After you left me, it was away for eleven years. You didn't really tell the correct wording what I have said to you. I can't remember what rank I was. Sir. It was rank, rank's not important. <laughs> <laughs> I said I wasted 13 years, so that obviously means I, my rank hadn't changed. He actually was away for 13 years. I did help him to get his fourth degree black belt when he wasn't with me at that time because his instructor was with him, didn't help him. And after 13 years, he came back and I said, okay, what degree are you? He said, four degree. I said, but I did not help you 13 years ago to get your fourth degree. He said, yeah. He said, you still four degree black belt? He said, yeah. I said, really, that silly? to stay that long without being a promote. Actually, he should be now about around seven degree. But unfortunately, in life, we make, a, we make direction. And that direction sometimes might work, might not work. But long as we don't lose the focus of the journey, and long as we don't lose our focus. And at the present time, yeah, I'm glad you two of you are right here, working together as a team to build up something for the community, whatever happened, you make sure you will, will carry on because you know we 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 same as we are alive, also we are dead at the same time. You know we never know, but whatever happened, that organisation need to continue. Whoever go first, organisation will continue. I think two of you, 
as a Paul Harper as well, Master Harper in the back. I think we've got a lot of good people to take, make sure this one legacy international Taekwondo Federation not to disappear because it's one person disappear. Agree. Uh, I think that will be uh, Paul with us. I think that's uh, the end of our day, the end of the, the launching the, you know, one, you know, one legacy international Taekwondo Federation. Again, I want to thank every person who have attending and every person who come over to witness that historical day. And as I said, we, are want, to, we want to promote John Shoy legacy. We want to promote something that can be very special for the community. I want to thank you all. We look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you very much for every single one. Cindy, you come to the front. Come forward. I just gotta tell you how I met Cindy a little bit, so you you will know. Is uh, I used to have a girl working for me, and I said to her, "I need someone to work." He said, "Yeah, I get someone." He said, "Oh, she's Lebanese, and she do, she's a very good cook." I said, "That's okay, no problem. Bring her in, and I make I make the tabbouleh. I'm a very good tabbouleh person, but I didn't mix it. When she walked in, I said, "Can you mix that tabbouleh?" They said to me, "A very good cook," and I can see her hand was just going like that. She was just shaking. I said, she mixed the tabbouleh, but tabbouleh wasn't very good. Uh, and I said, oh, what happened? And I, and I said that I don't know what his taste is. To me, it's perfect, but, you know. Everybody know what my taste is. And that was my taste. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Diana.